I know sometimes it's hard to understand these concepts, but I promise I'll make it quick. I will summarize all the research for you. I'll make your life very, very easy. That we will really help give you a system, a way to approach every single possible flexibility problem that you deal with and really have you be confident and understand what you are going to do what to actually do when you're in front of 20 athletes in a small little space with not a lot of time on your hands. What's the most effective usage of your time? Hey, everybody. What's going on? Look at all the people. That's... I feel like I need we need like elevator music. We should get like sponsored elevator music. You know? <laughs> that would be great. Dee -dee. That's Jeopardy. That's not elevator music. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at this. We had a great showing. Nothing's better than people like actually come live. It's so much more fun. Cool. All right. So we'll slowly get cracking here and we'll let people trickle in uh, as they come. So hey everyone, thanks for joining the party. I think these Q and A's are one of the more fun things we get to do. And I think we did the last one in May was on like strength conditioning stuff. And that was like a super, super, super helpful one for a lot of people. And people said it was really good and they got a lot of information out of it. I think this one is probably more of like a, a hot topic for people. They would rather, they, you know, they want to hear about everything, but flexibility is like a lot of people have struggling issues with flexibility. So I think that Q and A's like this are way more uh, helpful for people because we can actually talk back and forth. And it's like, I love answering emails and messages and stuff, but like sometimes when you just get like a paragraph back and forth, you really can't describe like what's actually going on and you can't have like a fluid discussion back and forth. So a um, couple quick slides here just to get everybody kind of involved. Um, this is us. Usually we have four fun people who are here. Becky and uh, Taylor are working on other projects right now, um, but I'm Dave, I'm CEO and I'm a sports PT. I'm a gymnastics coach and strength coach and I am a massive nerd. And then we also have the wonderful, amazing, uh, I wouldn't live without Sarah here. Sarah is uh, on our digital media team at Shift, but she's also uh, my VA. She's all sorts of amazing things that you can see here. She's a camera whisperer, video sorceress. Anything you've seen probably from Shift between uh, digital media and videos is either Sarah or Becky's just ridiculous handiwork. So uh, I do not take credit for any of those things. They are all of them, but Sarah helps with these and she's like our DJ on board. So she'll be uh, kind of fielding questions and helping kind of coordinate who's up next for questions, stuff like that. So that I can kind of, you know, help answer people right away and not have to worry about kind of doing all the things behind the scenes. But do you want to say quickly, um, before we kind of go into live questions stuff, the way this works is um, I'm really an open book. So everything that you have specific questions on, gymnasts that you work with, um, you know, questions you have, things that maybe you, you wish you had better clarification on that maybe has, has been challenging for you. If you want to really get like deep in the weeds and talk exactly about what's going on with you. Obviously we have to respect people like privacy. If you're talking about a gymnast, don't actually name them or, you know, you can't share their information specifically, but we can talk generally. Um, so I think that really helps because you get like specific questions answered for exactly what your problem is, right? Like the thing that is really like top of your mind, that's really concerning you or really bugging you. We can, we can talk about it and we can, we can have a chat about it. And I will do everything that I possibly can to try and share uh, some advice there or give you some resources or do something that will be useful. So um, the way we kind of do these things is we, we actually prefer live video chats, um, mainly because it's easier for us to help you. Uh, it's easier for us to have a conversation and chat back and forth and clarify and make sure we really answer your question. Um, you're, you are welcome to type it in the chat and Sarah will ask me uh, right up, which is fine. But sometimes it's tough because, you know, you're, you're kind of like, you know, hopefully getting your answered your question answered, but sometimes you kind of don't get a full complete answer. And then we move on to another question and you kind of feel like you're maybe uh, not getting a, a full picture. So we kind of would prefer people kind of chatting live on the video broadcast. We also share some of the replays and some of the best clips on social media. So people like to hear uh, from you because you probably, your question or your problem is probably a very similar question that many, many other people have as well. So obviously they would like to be able to, to kind of resonate with that too. So uh, before we do get cracking, um, we have a very exciting launch going on this week at Shift that if you're in this Zoom question and answer session for flexibility, you probably care about it a lot. Um, we kind of put together uh, the last 10 years of work uh, that I've put for 
everything I possibly think about with flexibility, whether it's split flexibility, straddles, pikes, handstands, shoulder, how to make warmups, how to make side stations, what active flexibility drills are good, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we finally put it all into one course and it's, it's uh, pretty good. It's uh, it's probably the best course that I think shift has ever launched. And the feedback from the hundred or so people that have already signed up is really, really amazing. Um, so I wanted to mention that to anybody who's maybe in this area and is looking for something to kind of help them kind of get a head start. Um, just some feedback from people from, you know, actual course users or, you know, things that actually work, right? They're easy to use drills. We try to make it very, very simple for you guys to understand. A lot of the people who said they found the course helpful were saying that it was really like a good system. It was a good step-by-step -step system to help them implement, not just like, as we all know, a bunch of random YouTube drills or a bunch of random like shaky iPhone videos that you get from a clinic. And it's, it's tough when you go back to the gym and try to apply those. So a lot of people were really happy with kind of our systemized approach to it, whether it's a warm up or whether it's a flexibility circuit or an active flexibility station or something like that. Um, and I think a lot of people really uh, just enjoyed it because it wasn't super complicated, right? It wasn't like a crazy elaborate setup with 14 mats and 94 things you have to do. And, you know, we all know the reality of working in a busy gym. So a lot of the people who are in the course now are saying that they're really enjoying it. And we've had uh, actually a handful of people actually finish it um, already. And they say that it's really, really useful. So if you're someone who is, is struggling with flexibility or whether it's splits, you know, or shoulder flexibility, pike, pancake, you work with young ones and you're trying to figure out what's safest for them to do. We cover a lot of the science about what the safest way to get the most effective, uh, you know, flexibility stuff is. And um, also we try to really cover, you know, what's the most effective based on the science. So most people in here don't care at all about the science. Um, they really just want to get the exercises. But I spend about uh, the first lecture just kind of wrapping up the summary of what does the science say for like how long to stretch? How often do you stretch? What type of stretching is the most effective? Uh, what things that you can do kind of minimally effective doses? And it really takes away uh, all the need for like really aggressive methods like ankle weights or pushing kids down, which we all know is really not safe and ethical. So it's kind of our way to replace that with really effective safe methods. So if you guys are curious about this, um, you can head to this uh, URL here. Sarah can also drop this in the chat here. So if you guys want to check out exactly what I've done with, you know, everyone from the compulsories all the way up to the international elites and a lot of the college teams, um, everything's in there. So yeah, I just want to mention that before we get cracking. Um, and we do have some questions that came um, in advance if people are a little, little nervous uh, to start, but I wanted to make sure that we had a good spread of things to talk about. Am I here, Sarah? I can't see my own cursor. Uh-oh. Stop here. Here we go. Um, yeah, so if anyone has questions that they would like to ask, like straight up, don't be shy. Um, we're very, we're very friendly here. We don't bite. Sarah and I are very nice. Um, so if you have a question and you would like to do that, Sarah, let's do one that came in first, um, whatever that first one was, and that will give people time to either write a question down or raise your hand or stuff like that. So what was the first? There was like two that came in or something like that. Okay. Um, so Jan asked. There is a lot of different opinions on if we should be using static stretching or not in warmups. Some people say do it to get passive flexibility and others say don't do it at all because it takes away power. Mm. What's the best approach? Mm, yeah, I do remember now why I wanted this question first. This is there's some questions that just repetitively I get over and over and over again. And this is definitely one of them, right? So I think when you're looking at, you know, does static stretching you know, is it useful? Is it not? I think you have to kind of look at the research and then also apply just like critical thinking, right? So if you look at this research that came out about, you know, static stretching and power losses, the, the methods of those studies were pretty hilarious, right? So what they did was they static stretch kids and like, you know, holding pike stretches or stuff, or whatever. And they literally went over and did like, okay, now run as fast as you possibly can, right? Or like go lift a weight as heavy as you possibly can. And so going from like literally laying down for five to 10 minutes and then being like, okay, go run really fast. Like, probably not going to make it, you know, easy to get your power up all the way. So that was the first kind of initial concern that came out was like, oh my God, you know, this, this static stretching thing, it's going to make someone lose all their power and we should never do it. And I think you see that actually online in coaching forums that like, as soon as somebody mentions static stretching, everybody else is like, yeah, no static stretching ever, only dynamic in the warm up, and, you know, never, ever do static or stretching at all. So I think if you look at the research, uh, newer research has come out that says that if you do static stretching and then you follow it up with a good dynamic warm up or some active flexibility, those power losses are trivial, right? They kind of go away. Like it's not like someone loses all their power all the way. So if you're doing a normal kind of sequence of a good warm up which I think most people intuitively do, right? You wouldn't be like, all right, girls, let's run static stretch and then go do vault, right? <laughs> that wouldn't be a good sequence of events. So I think when you see that somebody does sequence it in a, in a, in a um, step by step process, um, those, those dynamic warm ups can help counteract the static stretching. So um, 
a really good study came out in 2019, I think, which looked at all the literature and it said essentially, if you do static stretching as one part of a bigger warm up, right? So maybe you do some soft tissue work, like you foam roll, you do some active flexibility, you do a dynamic kicking warm up, you do some, you know, classic kind of gymnastics warm up stretching stuff we do, then you add some static stretching in there. So we personally like we'll have the girls do line splits to see their alignment and do some like holds for about 20 to 30 seconds. And then we continue on with like some jumping and kicking and leaping stuff. Uh, all the power gains are are really trivial, right? So you can still go on in your warm up and have a great stuff. So I wouldn't be afraid of static stretching. I really wouldn't. I wouldn't use it as my only warm up. I don't think like, okay, everybody circle up, hold this for 30 seconds, hold this for 30 seconds, hold this for 30 seconds. I don't think that's a good approach because that's not going to ramp the body up to get ready for a practice, right? You want to get the heart rate going. You want to get the blood flow going. You want to get the body ready to jump and run. So I wouldn't do an only all static stretching warm up, but I also wouldn't do, you know, no static stretching at all. Cause I think, I think both those ends of the spectrum are maybe a little bit too, uh, too not realistic. Um, if you do look at uh, studies that are saying like, okay, what's the most effective way to increase flexibility, like to increase passive range of motion, static stretching is actually the most effective way, right? So when you look at these reviews, static stretching compared to PNF, compared to active flexibility, compared to somebody passively stretching you to like ballistic stretching, static stretching five to six days per week for about two sets of 30 seconds or 60 seconds total is, is the most effective way to increase range of motion. So if your goal is to increase flexibility, static stretching is actually a phenomenal thing to give somebody, right? If your goal is to warm up for a practice, I wouldn't do as much static stretching. So um, yeah, that, that kind of, I guess, sums it up well. Like, so there's usually three in my head, there's three things, right? Before practice warm up. I'm trying to actually get more flexible. I'm trying to recover for the next practice. Static stretching seems to be okay a little bit in the warm up. It's really, really helpful to increase uh, range of motion passively. And as a recovery tool, there's not a lot of great research saying that stretching will help you recover faster for the next day. That seems to be more about like sleeping well and eating well and having a good periodization plan and having time between your, your practice sessions that are enough for someone to recover. And then uh, actually soft tissue work, like foam rolling, especially vibration assisted foam rolling um, is actually really, really helpful to reduce uh, perceived soreness. So if you're looking about, okay, what do I do? Add some static stretching in the beginning, maybe um, do some separate circuits, like a 15 minute flexibility circuit that has some static stretching in it is fine. Holding splits, you know, holding shoulder stretches. And then for a recovery, I'd probably go more on the um, you know, foam roll, soft tissue stuff, you know, that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, that was a really good question. So hopefully Jan, that was helpful. Not too bad for the first one. Alrighty. So, um, Quentin is yeah. going to ask their question on video. Quentin, let's do it, man. On mute. All yeah, right. There you go. There What's we that? go. What's going on? Oh, I lot. like your Christmas tree lighting. That's amazing. <laughs> I know. That's Girlfriend great. did that. She goes all out. <laughs> Come on, you did that. Don't say that. You did that. <laughs> What's up, man? Um, so from today's podcast that dropped, you were discussing the difference between uh, ballistic or dynamic versus passive versus static stre stretching. Mm -hmm. What's the difference yeah. between, what is it? static stretching versus passive stretching like what's okay. the difference between the two if you could explain it yeah first of all thank you for listening to the podcast i appreciate you um <laughs> for being a part of all things shift i appreciate you quite a bit um yeah so in the research it's uh static stretching is like when you put yourself in end range position and you hold that for like 30 seconds or whatever it's passive stretching is when somebody else puts you in that position right and the difference the biggest difference is that i don't care yeah how much Zen master you are, you can't fully relax when you're doing your own static stretch. So even if you hold a split and you're saying relax as much as I can, there's still guarding. There's still some like kind of protective uh, nature. So passive stretching is you can totally relax and somebody can move your leg through a range of motion. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times in the research studies, I don't know who volunteers for these studies, um, but what happens is they like pay people to, you know, go in uh, a machine that passively moves their hamstring up to their tolerable limit. And they hold that for 30 seconds. That's like, true research quality passive stretching versus gotcha. static stretching would be like i'm holding my own hamstring stretch for 30 seconds or something like that versus ballistic would be more like bouncing at end range like small bounces mm -hmm. spoiler alert uh, ballistic stretching is not very effective to increase range of motion and it's kind of the sketchiest so i would not recommend that right static stretching is a little bit safer and it seems to be pretty effective uh, to do so yeah so that's uh, static versus uh passive versus ballistic and was there one more or no no, I think it was those three. Those were the three that were I remember being highlighted today. 
but yeah, yeah, I just wasn't sure. I've never actually seen that done, but it makes sense. Yeah, Appreciate well, it. I think, um, and it's probably a good clarification point. Like, obviously, pushing people down is a terrible idea, right? Like, I, I hope yeah. you're doing that yeah. way. But passive stretching is a good way to do that. So, like, there's like coaches who are very safe and our partner stretching is very, very safe and effective. It actually is a really good way. Uh, static stretching and passive stretching are kind of the two most effective. Static and passive then active, I think, and then it was one more list that was lower. But yeah, passive, if, if the kids are mature and the coaches are mature and it's safe and it's done well, it's totally, totally fine to do. It's just when you get crazy and start, you know, pushing and doing monstrous things that it gets weird. Yeah. Uh, I got another one if I, if I can ask sure. it. Fire away, bro. Um, no, I was just wondering about ankle mobility. So I know when you go into a lunge and you try and keep your ankle close and then you drive the knee past, mm -hmm. is there any other exercises to work on ankle range of motion and increase mobility? besides doing that type of active pressing into and yeah. also does it you know as a second question if you drive you know to the left and to the right so interior and posterior uh, past the ankle does that differentiate with how far you can increase the range of motion yeah. or is it best to just go straight forward that's a great question. This is this is awesome. So I can hit two birds, one stone here, because I think the, the biggest thing that people aren't doing, that's one of the most effective ways to make flexibility gains is doing eccentric type strength training, right? And so I use this a ton for calf flexibility, because you can do eccentric calf lowers off a deficit or like standing off a mm -hmm. edge and get really, really good uh, motion changes. So for people who are unfamiliar, eccentric contractions are when a muscle is uh, contracting and lengthening at the same time. So if I were to do a bicep curl, this would be a con concentric contraction where my joint closes, my elbow joint closes. Isometric would be, I just, I just contract, but it doesn't go anywhere. And eccentric is if a weight was pulling my arm open, it'd be an eccentric contraction of my biceps. So if you look at the research on static stretching and all forms of stretching and foam rolling, it doesn't change the length of muscles over time. It doesn't actually make muscles longer, right? Eccentric uh, contractions, we, we think, right, is, is still theoretical. We think that it actually does increase some of the length of the muscle over time, which is super, super effective. That's like exactly what we want to do. So I think there was a really good paper that just came out saying doing um, like tree fall exercises or hamstring Nordic lowers. Um, it was really, really good to increase the actual length of some of the muscle tissue over time versus, uh, you know, static stretching or stuff like that probably just makes the muscle relax over time. So that's something I use a ton back to your question is for curls that really have stiff or guys that really have stiff calves, I'll have them do seated calf lowers where they put a really heavy weight on their knee and slowly lower down off like a four to six inch deficit. And the prescription is usually five repetitions of a five second lower with a five second end range stretching hold like two to three sets. And then again, like again, five to six days per week seems to be the most effective. So yeah, I do a ton of those for people that are really, really stiff. Um, I would say that's probably my first go-to is trying to do some eccentric calf lowering. And then to your second question of if the ankle joint is the thing that's, that's stiff, you want to try to go towards all kind of three areas of the toe, but more so towards the outside pinky toe, because that's kind of what the joint gets the most motion with um, if it's stiff, right? If someone's really tight in their ankle, they tend to kind of let their knee cave in towards the inside. So we're trying to promote someone to stretch towards the pinky toe because it kind of prevents that collapse from happening or the arch from collapsing like a flat foot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate Great all the question, explanations. Great yeah, question. absolutely. Cool. Sarah, just to make sure when we talk and stuff, does it flip back and forth between who's talking for the recording? Yes. Okay, cool. Nice. Fabulous. No problem, buddy. Great questions. Yeah. Who we got next, Sarah? All right. Um, Desiree is going to ask her question. Let's roll. On video. Yes. So I have a ballerina, um, mm -hmm. nondescript back injury. Um, I think they've settled on that it's uh, probably the SI ligament, SI joint ligament. Mm -hmm. And so um, she's been working on recovering from that and stabilizing the SI joint. Um, and I see some um, flexibility loss. I know she's afraid to combre forward, combre back. Uh, I think the other day she did like a pike stretch for her hamstrings and that was a little too much. So I'm wondering what sorts of things should she stay away from and what sorts of things can she do? Yeah. So I think the key here is to figure out whether like what segment of her pike stretch is, is limited, right? Is it like lumbar flexion that's problematic or is it like the hip joint that's flexion is limited or is it like the actual back of the soft tissue that's limited? Have you ever broken that down before? No, I haven't. I know she does have the tight hips as well, but um, I, I thought it was the actual lower back, the, the soft tissue, yeah. but that's a good, that's a good question. 
Yeah. Cause sometimes in my experience, when someone say this goes for like pike stretches, but also for like backbending, right? If somebody has one set, like one area of the body, that's not moving enough, typically they move more from the next joint that's next to it. Right. So in a lot of gymnasts or dancers or ballet, they won't have a uh, lumbar or like lower back rounding. Cause they're, they're really in an overextension most of the time. So they get really stiff into extension. Their pair, like their lumbar paraspinal muscles are always tonic and turned on. They can't like relax those muscles into a round. You should be able to flex your spine. So if you see someone who's really arched and they go to touch their toes and their back is completely flat, that's, that's not ideal, right? We'd like to see them be able to go arch, but also hollow and round equally as much. So sometimes what happens is they can't flatten their back or round their back into a hollow. So it starts to flex their, their, you know, SI joint, or maybe it pulls on their hamstring or the proximal part of their, their sciatic nerve. I'm sorry if I'm being really geeky real here. Um, it pulls on their nerve right up near their buttock because that area above is not moving. It tugs more on their hamstrings or more on their sciatic nerve. So the way you screen this out, and this is for anyone who just wants to get a p better pike stretch, right? Like I, I can't tell you how many people come to me in the clinic and have bad pike stretch or tight hamstrings or whatever. And they can't get into like a, a kit position if they're in compulsory or they can't do a leg kick if they're like cheerleading dance style. And a lot of the times when they stretch, they feel like intense pulling in the back of their leg. That's probably their nerve. It's probably their nerve that's there. It's irritable because something else is not moving enough. So to check their back, you have them go on hands and knees and just do a cat cow. And if they can't, cow is that cow or cat i don't know which is that that's cow right <laughs> i don't know <laughs> if they can't round their back um you would say they'd want someone to be able to go round at least a little bit because when you're not loaded against weight it's fine to round your back totally right that happens every single day so you would check that first to see if they could do that and if not they would do some like rounding rock back deep exhale breathing to try to see if they could get more relaxation i give a lot of those athletes deep exhale rock back breathing to try to get their back to, to round a little bit so if you check that off the list that's one then you have them lay on their back and just hug their knees to their chest, right? If they can get their hip joints to flex all the way up to their knees, they clearly have enough hip joint mobility to do what you're asking them to do. Then you check a uh, straight leg raise with a pointed toe, right? To see if it's hamstring length. Then you check another uh, leg raise with a dorsiflex toe, a toe up to see if it's nerve uh, limiting factor, right? So you can check the lower back, the hip joint, the hamstring, or the nerve itself and all three of those. And, and one of those four, is probably is probably limited and you know you do a different intervention for each you do the rock back breathing for one if the hip joint isn't moving you would do some like back, you know outside hip mobilizations uh, hamstrings you could do leg lowers eccentric rdls and then nerve glides for someone who has a sciatic nerve um you know mobility issue or isn't really gliding well so i've had some people who do a toe touch and they have a lot of discomfort with that you screen that out you do one of those exercises you know four to five times and then you retest it and they feel quite a bit more comfortable or they can reach quite a bit lower. So that, that'd probably be my approach, Desiree, is try those four. Cool. How's it going? Good question. That's how I check all kids for pike flexibility too, by the way. It's not just, so anyone here is like a gymnastics coach or someone who wants to work on that, just wants to touch the toes. Um, that's kind of how I go about the exact same thing. Before we move on, I think this was related to a question before the one that was just asked. Um, sure. Jennifer said, can you repeat what prevents the arch from collapsing? Uh, yes. So the ankle joint to get the ankle joint to move knee over toe to squat really deep or run or land or do a squat on, you have to have the calf muscles themselves have to be able to be flexible and the ankle joint itself has to be able to glide and move too. So you can, you can check those things that, you know, if you do someone, you kneel down and you have them do like a, a weight bearing lunge test. So you put their foot like five inches away from a wall and see, can you get your knee to tap the wall? If somebody can't get that, what oftentimes happens is either their heel will pop up off the ground, right? Their toes will spin out. They'll kind of like flip their toes out to the side so they can kind of like uh, collapse their arch and get more range or their knee will cave in inside towards the, the inside of their body. Like their knees will collapse in. That's essentially your body trying to find a way to get more motion when it doesn't have it from the ankle joint. So you would see one of those three things, which is the heel lifts up, the toes spin out, or the knees collapse in. And when we do the ankle uh, mobilizations that Quentin was talking about, we want to have somebody doing like a knee to wall stretch um, and put their knee towards the outside of their pinky toe. Because if we have them just go straight ahead or in, it's going to collapse the knee in. And you might not be moving the ankle. You might be just getting like a compensation um, because somebody can't really find the flexibility from their ankle joint. So um, yeah, I, I think that's what she was meaning, but that, that the arch collapse would happen if someone doesn't have ankle flexibility and they're not being careful to push their knee towards the outside of their toes when they're doing calf stretching. Okay, Maria's question 
Hi, what is your advice on increasing flexibility whilst also dealing with left-sided sciatica? Yes, so this is, quickly, this is closely related to the uh, question we just had about um, finding out why someone's limited. So if someone has like acute sciatic issues, which sometimes happens with low back pain, but it also sometimes happens when someone is, like I said, doing pike stretching with their toes up and they're grabbing their teeth and pulling forward, um, you really actually wanna stay away from doing any aggressive stretching to the area uh, for a little while, right? Because if somebody has an acute irritation of the sciatic nerve or of their lower back, Nerves don't love to be really, really stretched when they're a little bit cranky. So they also don't like to be compressed, right? So if you sit for a long time after you have like a low back issue or like say you're like whack your funny bone, and like you rested on the, on the car for a long time when you're driving, your fingers start to go weird. The nerves sometimes get irritated. So I actually probably wouldn't give somebody stretching when they're doing sciatic, uh, if they have sciatic flare up. You can do some things like nerve glides or um, some like opposite motions, right? If, if bending forward bugs you, you can do some like press ups on your stomach or some cat camels to make your back arch and take pressure off the nerve. But it's usually more uh, at the guidance of a medical provider. So I would probably, if, if someone comes to me with that, it's usually two weeks of, you know, not sitting in low chairs, not bending over too much, trying to do press ups, trying to do back bends, trying to get their hip flexibility in the front to be a little bit more their hip flexors, their quads trying to work on some of their mobility. And then I would slowly reintroduce maybe some of the, you know, uh, nerve motions that we were doing. We were just talking about uh, Desiree, which is like kind of the nerve glides we could do with a medical provider, or there's certain exercises you can do to slowly work your way back. Um, but if someone's stiff, quote unquote, when they have a sciatic flare up, it's probably more that the nerve is a little bit cranky. It's not that someone's truly tight. Um, and then after the nerve calms down, you know, after you kind of deal with that for a couple of weeks, then you can work on, you know, foam rolling, soft tissue work, some eccentrics, uh, single leg deadlifts, um, some low back flexion exercises like we talked about, but it's all really based on their symptoms. If they're calming down and they're uncomfortable, um, that's one thing, but if they're in a lot of pain, um, we don't want to keep doing flexibility work right away. So I hope I didn't just dodge your question, but that's just me being really honest. I'd probably wait a little bit to be careful. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, now um, Bandita is going to ask her question on video. Roll. Oh. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? I can. Loud and clear. Yeah. Uh, so I was uh, asking that if uh, you have serratus muscle weakness, does it affect your shoulder flexibility or your like overhead uh, range? Yeah. That's a very good question, Vanita. So I think it all, yes, it can limit overhead shoulder flexibility. And this is also a big one that people ask me about, which is like a winging shoulder blade or like, like winging scapulas, right? People always think like, if I have a winging scapula, like the death sentence, like I'm never going to be able to do anything with my shoulders ever again. Go ahead. So, the, so uh, I have a gymnast uh, whose scaps are good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, like her scap strength is good, but uh, like according to our physio, uh, they say that her serratus muscle is weak. So yeah. that's what is affecting her uh, during her swinging movements on the bars. It could be. So it could be. It's it's one possible option, right? So I don't obviously know what's going on, but there's a lot of reasons. But yes, if you have someone who has a lot of weakness in their serratus, the serratus obviously helps to kind of like rotate their shoulder blades upward, which points the shoulder socket upward. So that's how your arms go over your head. So it's possible that, it, that it's one of them. Um, there are a lot of other things that I'd probably want to check too, um, like lat flexibility, Terry's major flexibility, a lat you would test, you know, overhead on your back, Terry's major, you would scap lock somebody and then go overhead as well and see if they have range of motion there. I'd want to check pec minor flexibility to see if the shoulder blades can tip backwards, uh, upper back or thoracic spine flexibility, uh, upper back strength. Yeah, I want to probably check all those things, but it could very well be um, serratus is part of the problem. Okay, so like, how will it like? Uh, so it's a strength part, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so it won't be uh, like uh, like even if I uh, push her for the flexibility work, it won't work uh, that way, right? It'd be, yeah, it'd be tough. You probably want to do a combination of just isolated serratus strengthening and then also active flexibility drills. So serratus strengthening, you would do on your back, like heavy dumbbell jabs, right? You could do like dynamic bear hugs with a band. Those are really good as well. A lot of those have really good EMG activity to increase the serratus. You could do uh, weighted push-ups with a plus. So have some put like a weight vest on and you just push plus-ups. 
So you'd want to do those isolated always, but you'd also want to do some sort of active mobility work. I think one of the best ways is a reverse uh, crawl. So you put your feet on a slider and you walk backwards and it pushes the arm up into elevation and forces the serratus to kind of work overhead. So I would probably do a combination of actual strength work and like reverse slider crawls are really, really good as well. I'd probably try to do those for a couple of weeks and see if it changes anything at all. Okay, because uh, when I heard the healthy shoulders uh, thing, uh, when I went through that, in that uh, you said that uh, like eccentric uh, yep. uh, chin-ups will yep. help in, in case. Yep. So that, that did help uh, her, like it did make a difference slightly, uh, but then uh, we got a bit stuck. There is small, uh, like there is still a small uh, range that yeah. she's not able to open up. Yeah. And again, so I, I, think... I would really want to make sure the flexibility is the passive flexibility is there. So her thoracic spine, her lats, her teres major and her pec minor, those four things have to be like really, really mobile before you start attacking only strength things. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I have one more question. Sure. Uh, can I ask? Yeah. yeah. So um, in a back bending, uh, mm -hmm. backward bending we do. So there are a few gymnasts who bend only from one spot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how do we uh, like uh, stop them from doing and like teach them uh, to bend like from each and every part of their back, back bend? Yeah, that's so an awesome question. Yeah, so there are many gymnasts like they just go and bend from their only from their lower back or their yep. mid back. Yep. Yeah, it's so, a great question. And for this, you have to separate people into do you not have the flexibility to even get into the proper back bending shape? Or are you just not, you know, thinking and focusing on technique and proper muscle strength and activation? So the first way you have to check it out is you have to check again. Um, overhead shoulder flexibility, right? So seated against the wall, doing the back to wall shoulder uh, kind of stick stretch that I think maybe a lot of people know about that I've put out. So sit down, see if you can get your arms overhead. Yeah. You'd want to see if they have that. Then you'd want to check their upper back flexibility. So you do that by having them sit down and see if they can turn 45 degrees each way. And then also do a seal stretch. And you want to see if their back can bend fully backwards. So you do a checklist, right? You check out shoulders, good or not good thoracic spine or upper back, good or not good. And you want to do some hip flexor assessments as well. So a Thomas test is probably the best way to do this. You have someone sit on the edge of a block, lay back, hug one knee, let it drop down, quads, hip flexors. Then you can also do what's called a favor test, right? So you lay on your back, do a figure four position and see if maybe the Quantum. groin muscles. Yep. So I check all yeah. those off first. I'd say, do they have shoulder flexibility, upper back flexibility, uh, hip flexibility. And if they have flexibility of all those three things, right. And their lower back arches, that's someone who's just really naturally flexible. And it's just kind of a Gumby and it's more about strengthening and control, right? So the person who needs flexibility work, I'd obviously work on whatever we find on the screens of shoulders or upper back or whatever, every day, or sorry, five to six days per week, probably, you know, two sets of 30 seconds, static stretching, some active flexibility work, some eccentrics, like you said, with the bar. If there's someone who's just really, really hypermobile and is just really, really kind of like loosey goosey, it's more about isolated strength work and then also teaching some patterns to back bend. So again, I'd work the opposite of the shoulders not going up is the upper back, right? So face pulls, feet elevated rows, renegade rows. I'd go crazy on upper back strengthening as well. For the upper back, you could do like on your stomach, hands behind your head off the end of a block, just working on arching from your upper back, get your thoracic spine extensors to be stronger. And then for the glutes, you'd want to work on single leg hip lifts or side plank clamshells, side plank leg lifts, single leg RDLs to strengthen the back of the hips to have the strength to push open backwards, right? So that's like the strength bucket, someone who's maybe just not strong enough. And then lastly is someone who's flexible enough, they're strong enough, but they're off in la-la land and their technique is maybe not uh, the greatest. Some of the younger ones who are a little bit more kind of out in the clouds. So that's about teaching them how about body tension. So I think Nick Ruddick's five dimensions of a flat line is the best way to start here. Just do they understand how to brace their core and squeeze all the muscles in their glutes and their quads and their upper back, like really, really just on the ground flat line first, because you have to understand muscle activation and body tension before you can use shaping, right? So I would start with lay on your stomach, lay on your back, standing, all that kind of stuff. And then I would move into, okay, let's back bend now with a nice tight arch, right? So kneeling against the wall, arms up overhead, reach back as far as you can with your shoulders, squeeze the core, squeeze the glutes, more glutes. I try to teach people to move with their shoulders and their hips more 
than their lower back. So give me a tight core brace, but lots of shoulders, lots of hips. And then you just slowly move people away from the wall to get more and more extreme motions. But it's really about cueing their upper back and their glutes quite a bit. Then you move on to dynamic shape changing, right? So um, arch hollow snaps like over a barrel. So lay on your stomach over a barrel and show me arch hollow snap or hang from a bar and show me arch hollow fish taps. Um, or doing a handstand shape changing drill like off a barrel against the wall. I kind of work my way up from, okay, flexibility, check or not check, uh, basic strength, check or not check, core strength, check or not check, body tension, check or not check, shape changing technique for actual skills. Some kids get all the way up there, but as soon as they do like a back handspring or back walkover, they just don't have the technical awareness to, to squeeze their body or they're nervous. So it's okay, all this stuff is okay. It's about actually tensioning and, and maybe more specific drills for back handspring or back walkover or your chenko or Takacha, like whatever else it is. So that's a very long answer, but I hopefully gives you all the things that could possibly be. <laughs> yes, yes, cool. thank you. No problem, yes. Anita, thanks. Okay, so I'm very sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Yi asked, is it possible for everyone to sit in a full split with hips entirely square? Should we just make sure that they are activating the hip muscles and not worry about how square they are at the end range? All right, yeah, I might ruffle some feathers on this one, but I actually don't think it's anatomically possible to do full square splits. I don't think if you look at the way hip joints are designed, they're angled out a little bit, like 25 to 30 degrees. And the way your hip and your pelvis is aligned, um, it's, it's probably not ever going to happen that somebody can get a perfectly square split. So with that being said, if you look at ballet dancers who get like x-rays while they're in a split, we've seen some gymnasts in college have gotten x-rays of this as well. In order to get a full split, not only do you need to have really unique shaped hips, so your hips have to be really shallow, you also have to be really, really loose jointed, like really, really hypermobile. And you also need to have a little bit of your hip joint actually separates just a little bit to get a little bit more space for your, your leg to go all the way behind you. So even in someone who's really, really loose jointed, has really, really shallow hip sockets, and it has that ability to kind of go out, which is kind of just a natural flexibility thing. Um, even those athletes don't have perfectly square hips. And so if you get that kind of under your belt, the idea that someone's going to have a better leg split, they round off on one side, they do all their switch leaps on one side, they step in with one side, they hurdle with one side, you're naturally going to get one hip that develops more to go forward on one side and the other side doesn't. So it's like a baseball player, right? They have one really, really crazy loose shoulder. The other side is not as loose because they don't use that all the time. Gymnasts are the same way. They kick with one leg, they hurt it with one leg. So even if someone does have all those things for a proper square split, they're probably not going to have three square splits. They're probably not going to have a right and a left and a straddle all the way down. So, and that's in someone who has like no different anatomy in their hip joints. They're, you know, very, very symmetrical, which also doesn't happen a lot. So long answer. Um, I would say I would, I would try to maximize as much as you can uh, with those splits by doing soft tissue work, by doing eccentrics, by doing active flexibility, by doing uh, proper stretching every single day, by screening those athletes out and trying to make sure they're going through the right motions they need. I would try to really get one split that looks amazing. I would try my best to get the other split in the straddle uh, as far as it possibly can, but I'm not going to you know, be way too aggressive if somebody doesn't have full square splits and kind of, you know, I even think there's some places, unfortunately, like make kids feel bad because they don't have all full three square splits and they like kind of look down on them. They're like, oh, you know, like look at how big that split is. You know, like some kids are naturally born with unique hip sockets or in some cases, I think, unfortunately, the coaching staff or the medical staff, or even I've made this mistake myself too, before I read a lot of research is maybe not using the most effective methods that the science supports as, as our ways to increase flexibility. They maybe still use ankle weights. They may be still using really aggressive pushing methods, right? They're like crazy, uh, crazy hard complex drills versus just following a basic consistent program and trying to get uh, good progress over time. So yeah, I think for people that are really naturally uh, gifted and pick the right parents, you know, I'm not going to be in the NBA. I'm like five, six. So I don't have the height gene, but I have some flexibility genes. But for people who have really good, uh, you know, genetic predisposition and they work really hard, their coaches are consistent with their practice and they're stretching every day and they're really, really working hard in their technique. They can probably get really, really good at three splits. I just don't think it's realistic to have all three splits super flat and super square um, all the time, which is the last thing, right? Like some people this kind of cracks me up. Some people will like sometimes do their splits and stuff and then they'll do like a really, really hard leg workout or a really, really hard training circuit. The next day they'll come in and the splits will be like all really, really tight and they'll get upset. And they'll be like, oh, why aren't your splits down? Be like, uh, I did 500 squats yesterday. That's probably why. 
You know, like if you, if you do a really hard leg training program, they come back the next day and their splits are like six inches off the ground. That's normal. That's like, that's exactly what's supposed to happen with delayed onset muscle soreness. So it's uh it's unrealistic to think that somebody can be really, really flexible and really, really strong and really, really powerful, you know, every single day. So we have to kind of give kids a, a break, you know, when maybe they go through a really hard training day and they're growing, oh, what 80% of the people we work with are growing. So like growing is, is hard, right? Like your leg bones grow way faster than your muscles can keep up. So it's very, very common for people to lose their flexibility and have it come back and then go away and come back. So uh, long answer there, but yeah, I don't think even in the most amazing of situations, someone is going to have full three full square splits. And I think some of my friends who are doctors would agree with that hip surgeons. All right. Um, <clears throat> Jennifer is going to ask her question on video. Let's go. Okay, can you hear me? Hi, Jennifer. Okay, hi. I just have a quick question. It seems like our, uh, a bunch of girls have developed some really like tight hips. Most of them say it's their hip flexors. Um, yeah. Some of them have progressed and said it, it like wraps around into their groin. And then for a few, it's now I feel like it's progressed into the lower back. So mm. is there, I, I, we cannot figure out if there's something specific we're doing or not doing. Mm. Um, is there a way other than the basic stretches? Yes, this is a very good question. So, or is it a weakness problem or a good issue? It could be, yeah, it could be. So there's a couple layers here, no pun intended. Um, gymnastics, hmm, I'm gonna put this in a polite way. Gymnastics traditionally, and I made all these mistakes, so I'm, I'm on the frying pan here too as well, but like a lot of the really aggressive deep lunging type stretches you see with the back being really overextended for like choreography or like even like a classic hip flexor stretch in gymnastics, it's not stretching your hip flexor, right? It's like very arched in your back. It's a very deep lunge. And if you look at the anatomy of your hip flexor, it starts at your lower back, at your spine joints. So in order for you to stretch your hip flexors, you have to be super, super hollow right? Like really, really tucked under really, really hollow. Then you have to squeeze your glute super, super hard on that side. And when you do it uh, specifically like that, it's called a true hip flexor stretch. It does not look impressive at all. It does not look that glamorous because you don't move anywhere, right? It's like two inches forward. You're like, oh, my hip flexor, your quad. So I think in a lot of people, and I've worked with a lot of people for hip flexor strains or growth plate hip flexor issues or, or label issues. They're doing these really, really deep lunges and these really, really deep stretches and splits. And it's putting more pressure on the ligament and on maybe the labrum too as well. So what happens when you do that, and I'm not saying this is you, I'm just saying this is a, tr a general trend in gymnastics and dance and cheerleading is you put pressure on the ligaments or the labrums and your body's like, ooh, that doesn't feel great. So what does it do to protect you? It tightens your hip flexor up to make sure that hip joint is not sliding too far forward. The hip flexor joint is in front of your hip socket. So when your hip goes forward in a really deep lunge, if the hip flexor is there and it's getting pressed on from behind, it's gonna go, uh-uh, and it's gonna tighten up and it's gonna try to push backwards against that. So it's this vicious cycle where my hip flexors feel tight, quote unquote, I do these really deep lunges stretches or these really deep oversplits. The joint gets a little cranky, especially when someone's growing and has open growth plates. The body says, uh-uh, we don't like that. And it tightens back up the other way. So that, that's what I see a lot of times is the, is the repetitive, I can't quite get this to be uh, going forward. So the fix for that is doing static stretching, true hip flexor stretch. So hips tucked under, two sets of 30 seconds, right? Every single day, five to six days per week, using those, using really good active flexibility drills to try to promote the glute muscles and the butt muscles lifting up. So jumps and banded kicks and leaps and all the stuff that we would do, right? Doing some of those every single day. Eccentrics are really, really good here for this, right? So a rear foot elevated split squat, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that at all, but your back foot goes up on a mat and you hold dumbbells in your hands and you tuck your hips under and you do a slow split squat all the way down, right? That stretches your hip flexor and your quad like crazy if you're doing it right. So tucking your you hips- you say the name of that? Ooh, a rear foot elevated split squat? Yeah, rear foot. Yeah, say the name of that again. Sorry, you said it so fast. It's okay. I, I get excited sometimes. Uh, it's a rear foot elevated split squat or a Bulgarian split squat. Yeah. So just like eccentrics for maybe the hamstrings, you could do single leg RDLs if someone's really tight, Romanian deadlifts. You could do eccentric rear foot elevated split squats. Again, five repetitions of a five second lower 
with a five second hold. And if you really tuck your hips under, when you lower down into a split squat, it feels like a huge quad and hip flexor stretch, right? So you would do static stretching on a true hip flexor stretch. You would do some active flexibility drills. You could do some eccentric rear foot elevated split squats. And then you could also maybe be careful about how much hip flexor volume you're doing in some of your strength and conditioning, right? So those things are kind of more effective to probably get the hip flexors to stay not only relaxed, but you're going to strengthen them in a nice elongated position. And it's probably going to hold on for a little bit more. So that's probably the more effective way to go about it. And then um, I think, yeah, a lot of times I see kids who have really, this is a, a bigger point. It's really good. The kids who have like really chronically tight hip flexors and really chronically tight quads. And you look at their strength and conditioning program, they're doing tons of leg lifts and tons of squats and tons of running and tons of jumps on beam. And then what do you do for seven hours per day between practice and being at home? You squeeze your legs together and you keep your knees straight, right? They're just, they're using their quads all day long. So you have to, and the kids that are really, really tight, you have to maybe take away the, the leg lifts and give them slider crawls. So you can still work on their core, but you're not doing repetitive hip flexion over and over and over again. You can take away the L holds and do some other core exercise, like a plank drag through, right? So if you look at the kids that have chronically tight hip flexors, if you watch them at practice, they're probably doing five to a thousand hip flexing movements every single day, kips, leg lifts, jumps, leaps, right? So take away some of the repetitive hip flexion and work on the other exercises that I just talked about addition by subtraction, then also kind of getting away from irritating the joint capsule and maybe getting the muscles. It happens a lot with the upper, the upper shoulder flexibility too, right? These kids that can't do a bridge because their shoulders are so tight, right? They're there. You look at like, okay, are you doing foam rolling to your lats, right? Which is something else you can do like vibration assisted foam rolling for your quads and your hip flexor. And then are you doing uh, specific shoulder stretches for your lats? So not somebody pulling your arms over your head because that's stretching the joint capsule and getting that shoulder cranky reverse grip PVC stick elbows up on a block round your back and get a nice lat stretch through there, right? eccentric chin up lowers, right? Jump up to a bar, slowly lower down for five seconds. Those are the most effective ways to get the lats to strengthen out a little bit, right? Make sure the upper back's flexible. But then you look at those kids and you say, okay, your shoulders are still tight. Look what they're doing in their strength programs, rope climbs, leg lifts, lat pull downs, pull-ups, chin-ups, right? Like leg lifts. It's like underarm, 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 underarm. They did 19 rope climbs and 47 sets of leg lifts. And those things are important, don't get me wrong. But if you do so many of them, your lats get super, super tight. You're not gonna be able to put your arms up over your head. So maybe one day per week, we take away the rope climbs and we do face pulls, right? To get their upper back stronger. Or maybe we do some uh, feet elevated rows, which is where your feet are up on a block, the opposite of a push up, and you're rowing up to a low bar and pulling to your chest. You're still getting strong, you're still working the biceps, but you're not working the lat muscles over and over and over again. I can't tell you how many kids I look at their strength program and I'm like, yeah, no wonder your shoulders are still tight. Your hip flexors are still tight. You're doing 5,000 leg lifts and L holds every single day. And you know, you're doing this really aggressive uh, stretching methods, but they don't really have a ton of great science to support, you know, stretching the muscle and, and not the ligament. So there's a really good example. I wish I had the picture of, of a college gymnast that I worked with for a long time. And she had really aggressive hip issues and really aggressive lower back issues. And she had full splits, right? Like completely full splits but her back hurt so bad and her hips hurt so bad. When I did her Thomas test and when I did her favor test, they were like the most positive I've ever seen. So this girl had full splits, but she was missing like 25 degrees of hip flexibility, of hip flexor uh, stre stretching and quad stretching. And she had like the tightest groin I've ever seen in my entire life. So like, okay, well, how do you have full splits, but you're that tight? She's stretching her joint capsule out like crazy. She's putting a ton of pressure on her lower back and that's why her hip joint hurt and that's why her back hurt. So we took away all of her like super aggressive, you know, really deep lunging stretching. We used it in dance and choreography, but she was holding like two minute over splits every single day on both legs. That was her main way to stretch. That's like what her coach told her to do. So we took away some of that stuff. We screened out what was wrong, gave her static stretching for specific muscle groups, true hip flexor stretch, gave her some soft tissue work, gave her some eccentrics, gave her some strength programming balance to make sure she's not doing hundred leg lifts. She got much better in like, you know, a month maybe you know, after eight years of stretching her hips every single day through JOs and through college. So I think a lot of people fall into that category of they're just doing a ton of stuff that, you know, looks awesome. And I think it's great for dance and flexibility and stuff. But if you want a specific program to deal with hip flexor and quad, you got to screen it out and you got to follow what the science says about, okay, how many, how many sets and reps, how many days per week, let's use eccentrics, let's use active flexibility. Let's make sure there's a good balance here in our strength and conditioning. So yeah, that was a large rant. Okay. Jennifer. I'm so sorry. Yeah, that was 
That was super helpful. Actually, I just have one more question. We've yep. done like the true hip flexor and all of that stuff, but I think you hit it when you said just doing a like a ton of, uh, you know, leg lifts and stuff like that, just too much activation. When you do the east, and probably need to add some more of that east centric. So, is there a better time in the practice to do that? Is it better to do that at the end? Is it better to do it at the beginning or the end of a bar workout? Or yeah, is a there a question. good time to put that? That's a great question. So. You know, if you look at the research and you ask when the best time to do it, what they think is best is not practical as a coach, right? There's no way you could stop your practice and do what they're asking. So I personally, in the warm up, if I have someone come in and have an issue, I would have them come in early and try to do some of the foam rolling and do some of the eccentrics and stuff like that. Our dynamic warm up has kicks and active flexibility and like the static stretching stuff. We do a lot with event side stations because let's be real, right? Like I got stuff to do, man. Like I got, I got like skills to work, I got routines to work. Like I can't stop the practice and do like everything. So a side station, like beam is awesome to put in some active flex with TheraBand on the side, right? Or bars is great to put on an active flex station, like shoulder blade circles or something like that. Or, or, you know, there's always a way you can fit one or two in. So sprinkling in some of that together. And then two times a week, uh, I advise people to do a 15 to 20 minute flexibility circuit where it's one day for upper, upper body, one day for lower body. So pick your five favorite things, right? Like your true hip flexor or quad stretch, your uh, banded kicks for leaps, your uh, eccentric rear foot elevated split squats, and then tumble track jumps and do that three to four times in a row. That is way more effective than, okay, over split in the left for two minutes, over split in the right for two minutes, over split in the straddle for two minutes, over split in the other straddle for two minutes, pike stretch for two minutes. Like, okay, same amount of time. And uh, interestingly enough, if you look at some of the research on length of hold time so they look at all the studies of like people who stretch about 60 seconds in, in a stretch and between one and two minutes and then over two minutes they're all the same stretching 60 seconds is equally as effective as one to two minutes is equally as effective as two plus minutes so okay if i if i can get the same effect with 60 seconds why in the world am i going to hold two plus minutes and we all know that after two plus minutes you're starting to get some irritation of the hip joints and again we go back to this vicious cycle of you hold a really long stretch that gets really really aggressive you're probably stretching the joint capsule out and your body's like uh-uh and you peg leg away and you feel super sore, it's probably because you pushed it a little bit too much. So yeah, I'd probably go circuits a couple times per week, but you want to try to get five to six days per week of some sort of stretching to see really good flexibility change. So a little bit in the warm up, a little bit before practice, a little bit side station, a couple days per week, you know, hip and shoulder flexibility. Um, I've seen super, super good results with that. And I'm talking about kids that are like crowbar status, like just pick the wrong parents, unfortunately, right? And they, they've had really good progress. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, what, what are you eating? You got something good? Yeah, it's curry. <laughs> hey, don't <here we> go. <laughs> Pretty good. Um, so, <laughs> put me on the spot. Okay. Kim, <laughs> Kim Davis um, is wondering what the best way to go about getting her middle splits is. Oh, yeah. Let's go. By the way, everyone, I love Sarah, so I tease her. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So middle splits, I think we talked about left and right splits. Middle splits are a couple of things. One is that the hip joint itself has to be flexible enough to do that thing. So you have to have, in order to get a full middle split, you need someone who has a little bit of a naturally good hip socket, right? So if a hip socket, someone's born with a hip socket, that's really, really deep. Um, and these people typically don't go in gymnastics. So it's not, they, they kind of get weeded out when they're like in preschool, right? Um, but if someone has a naturally flexible hip socket, that's kind of number one. But in order to get really good middle splits, you need the groin muscles to be extremely flexible, right? So I don't, I don't want to go into it because it's, it's, it's way too nerdy, but there's some groin muscles that actually work as hip flexors. So they actually help with leg lifts and sprinting. There's other groin muscles that work to squeeze your legs together. And there's other groin muscles that kind of help out with the hamstrings to work on kicking your leg behind you. So you have to make sure that you're working all of them if you want to get a good middle split, right? But I would particularly pay attention to the inside leg muscles. So I would, um, I would do uh, some, some foam rolling and soft tissue work to the inside of the groin, right? That'd be kind of step one. I'd probably do 30 to 60 seconds every single day. You don't need to go crazy. The research says you don't need to go like 10 out of 10 spiky foam roller, light yourself on fire. That's not like going to be more effective, but just gentle discomfort a little bit. Okay. I would do specific groin stretches that are stretching the muscle and that are not doing the joint capsule. So the same way that that really deep lunge is probably going to be a little bit uh, too aggressive on the hip joint capsule itself. Um, sometimes doing like a deep frog stretch is very similar. It puts a lot of pressure on the ligaments and I don't think it's bad, but when kids do groin stretches, they have to 
get their core engaged. They have to really be squeezing their butt muscles to make sure that they're active in their stretch. It's not just like, okay, flop down and wishbone my hips off. So the two that I really like for the inside groin are going to be a half kneeling inner thigh rock. So they kneel, the leg goes out to 45 degrees, they tuck their hips under, squeeze their butt, and they kind of are rocking sideways, kind of like out towards the side. So my knee is straight ahead off to the side. That way I move out and you're kind of rocking sideways this way, right? So that gets the inside of the groin really, really good. And, and on the YouTube channel, Shift has some videos for this if you want to see it. That's a really, really good uh, one there. The second one would be if you put your, you're on hands and knees, right? And you put one leg straight out to the side, it's called a, uh, an inner thigh rock back. So you go as low as you can, almost in a one legged straddle split, but you're super hollow with your core leg is straight. You're squeezing your butt muscles and then you rock straight backwards. So you keep your back flat and you rock straight backwards. Again, this is on shifts YouTube channel too, but that gets the inside in the back of the, uh, the groin and the hamstrings kind of working together. So a combination of the groin rocks and then a combination of the one legged rock backs. I would do some soft tissue work. I would do the groin legged rock back and I would do the half kneeling one. And then I would do some sort of active flexibility work for uh, the groin. I think my probably easiest one is probably going to be reptile slides. So you lay in your stomach, put your hands on your head and you're doing essentially trying to get your knee to come up and tap your elbow. And that's like using your hip muscles to lift your leg up into a straddle up and down. You could also do some side band kicks as well. So now we kind of have stretching, we have some soft tissue work, we have some active flexibility. And I really, really like for both front splits and for side splits is eccentric sliders. So hands are between a panel mat for a front split, front leg is up on a slider, and you're slowly lowering down for that five second with a five second hold and using your hands to push back up. You do the same thing with a straddle split. So your hands are in front, of you want a trapezoid, leg it out to the side, you slowly lower down for five seconds into a straddle split with one leg, hold for five seconds, come back up with your hands pushing you up. That's a really good eccentric way to stretch your straddle split. So if I was trying to give someone an exercise circuit, I would do every day. So five to six days per week, two sets of 30 seconds of the uh, foam rolling, two sets of 30 seconds of each stretch. So the rocking, the rock back on both sides, five repetitions of a five second lower with a five second hold, maybe a couple sets of that on the eccentric sliders. And then I would go two to three sets of 10 of the reptile slides in the, in the kick, kicks. I do that five to six days per week. And I would look to see if my split got better over time. That's probably the most effective circuit that I've ever seen for straddle splits is those four to five things in a row done five to six days per week for at least three weeks in a row. And if someone's really not making progress with there, you'd want to have somebody uh, get screened by a medical provider and make sure they don't have like really unique shaped hips. Um, Cause sometimes kids do have like unique hip anatomy that won't allow them to do a straddle. I've seen that in a couple of people before. And it was like, Oh, unfortunately, I just don't know if a straddle is what's going to go all the way down. Be great at switch leaves, switch rings, all that kind of stuff. Okay, um, Vandita here. Uh, just uh, for the eccentric one, uh, for the middle splits, you say. So, do you prefer it like on the heel itself, or you want the toe dropped like yeah, that? Good question. I would put the foot down flat, Vandita. So, I would put the foot flat because if the heel is up, it's going to be more hamstring. If the toe is up towards the ceiling and the heel is down, it'll be more hamstring. We're trying to get the groin. So I'd flip the foot down flat and I'd want to get the inside of the leg more refocused. Okay. And while doing the split also the same thing or th that time we have to like. Yeah. So that's a little bit more. Upon... I, th I think that most Sorry. people want to see the knees most people want to see the knees rolled back for like proper presentation and form and roll under. So to get the mobility and the flexibility of the groin muscles, I would say it's probably going to be more toes down, but for actual like straddle jumps and straddle splits and stuff, you'd want to have the knees rolled back um, to try to get more of like, that's like just like technique based stuff. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Great. Alrighty. Um, next up, we're going to have Lori ask her question on video. Lori. Hello. Hi, um, I'm actually, my name's Summer. I'm on my mom's account. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, so um, I, I'm a level 10. I practice six days a week, four hours nice. every day. And my back is always like so like tight and like stiff. My upper back mostly, my mm -hmm. lower back sometimes, but I'm like, it, it hurts a lot. And like my spine hurts a lot. And so I then I know it's like has something to do with my shoulders and my shoulders aren't that flexible, but I stretch them like every day and I do bridges and I do bridges up against the like wall and I do bridges with my feet up on the block. I have my coaches stretch my shoulders and they just like don't mm -hmm. get more flexible. So I was wondering if there's any way I could help my back get less tight and other shoulder stretches I can do. Yeah, that is great. I'm power to you for like hopping on here and just asking you a question. That's amazing. 
get it, girl. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I proved it. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a couple things here. One is you have to make sure that your upper back is not the issue, right? So like the upper back like can round like this. If it doesn't arch the other way, um, that can be by itself a huge issue. So you can screen that. You can get like a, a physio to screen that, stuff like that. But uh, essentially like back bending over a foam roller and doing some like active turns and stuff. Um, that's probably going to be the best way to get like the flexibility of your upper back better, like uh, windmills are called too. So I would do those two things first, but with stretching and stuff like that. So yeah, I can't tell you how many times, like I just had my coaches like pull on my shoulders and like they were, I'm like on a beam stretch, they're pushing me down. I'm pulling my own arms up. It's probably not stretching the muscles that are stiff. It's probably just putting a lot of pressure on you. You ever feel like pain on the top of your shoulder when that happens at all? Yeah. So that's probably like your shoulder joint and your rotator cuff getting irritated. And, the, and again, that's like, just gymnastics has done that for years and years. And I did that as a coach too, but it's not probably getting the stuff under here. That's tight. If you're level 10, that means you're swinging some hard skills. And the more you do them, the tighter your lats get and the tighter your pecs get. You need to focus on just that, right? And the way you do that is you do soft tissue stuff, get a vibrating foam roller and do foam rolling underneath your arms, 30, 60 seconds on both sides. You do a, a PVC stick stretch, which is where you put your elbows up and you flip your palms backwards and you round your back. Yep. Chin up eccentric lowers, right? And then you have to do this stuff five to six days per week for at least a minute of each exercise every single day. And you have to get your upper back like stupidly strong. Again, you're probably in the category of, I don't know how many like chin ups and rope climbs and leg lifts you're doing. That stuff is like all the same muscle groups that are probably really, really stiff on you and like push ups, right? If you're doing a ton of push ups and a ton of chin ups and a ton of rope climbs, that's literally going directly opposite to what you want to try to get, which is the muscles that are stiff to loosen up. So you probably got to adjust your strength conditioning to not do in all those exercises as much and replace them with some stuff for your upper back to try to keep the flexibility balance between how tight your chest is and your underarm is and then how underneath you are, right? Does that make sense? Is any of that ring a bell or you're like, no, nah, I'm doing all that? No, we do, except like the only issues is like we have to follow our coach's conditioning. Oh, totally. And like, it's kind of annoying because we have to do condi conditioning and strength first yeah and like so then we can't it's just like i don't i think that's wrong i think we should be doing it last yeah um, i and i get it man as a, as a coach right too like there is there's definitely a benefit to doing some strength in the beginning but i understand too how challenging it is for you to kind of like you're doing something you think is probably making the opposite direction you want to yeah. go but you could probably try to get to the gym and do some of this stuff beforehand and then just see if like not, it's not like not do pull-ups and not do row climbs. You have to do them to get strong. You mm -hmm. have to do bar conditioning, but it's like one day per week switching out. Like I was saying, like pull-ups for face, face pulls or for feet elevated rows, or like one day per week, you switch out rope climbs for something else. You're still going to yeah. get strong. You're still going to get your, your bar strength up, but you're not going to be like feeding the fire of what's, what's the problem. Um, and if you email me or like talk with Sarah, like I can give you a list of exactly like if you were in front of me, what I would give you to do every single day. Cause I, I treat like a hundred people like you that are like, literally, this is not working. And it's just a little bit of like chess, you know, to kind of figure out like what things you have to work on and then what things you got to take away and just do some screens to see if you're making progress. Like I, I guarantee within four weeks, if you do stuff every single day and you can modify your strength a little bit, to just switch exercises out. You'd probably see really good progress. Okay. I think if I talk to my coaches too, I'm like, if, I'd rather like this help me than like I just stay in the same spot. They'll probably like, be fine. Exactly. Yeah. And some of the stuff too, right? Like when you're doing shoulder stretching, like you should not be feeling anything on the top of your shoulders at all. Like it should oh, all it's so bad. Yeah. It's that's, so that's bad. Just, like, I can't, just like, like cuff impingement. So what's happening is you're probably squishing your rotator cuff and some of your like your labrum, and it's making your shoulders so cranky, they're getting tighter to protect you. Like the same thing with the hips we were just talking about before. Like mm -hmm. I literally used to do that too. Like, like pull people's arms up and think it was working. But if you pull on your shoulder joint, your brain's like, uh-uh, no thanks. And it like spasms to protect you. That's probably what's happening. So you keep okay. going the other direction a little bit. So there's hope here. Don't worry about it. Okay. There's hope here. But okay. yeah, grab, grab my email from Sarah and then we'll, we'll hook you up. Okay, thank you. No problem. All righty, next up. Oh, quickly, Jennifer uh, asked, how many eccentric lowers between panels for groin slash splits? Oh yeah, Sorry. same kind of deal. Usually pretty much everything eccentric. So pull up lowers, chin up lowers, whatever. I go for, are you gonna attack by a bug? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I usually go um, two to three sets of a five second lower with a five second hold at the bottom. So jump to the low bar, chin up lower all the way down. But real life scenario, coaching with a gym, I would pick a stretching exercise, a um, what am I thinking? Stretching exercise, an active flexibility exercise, 
a eccentric exercise and some sort of like, you know, actual skill for a drill and do them in a circuit. So quad stretch for 30 to 60 seconds, go over to the panel mats, five slides, five second lower, five second hold, go over to the bands, 10 band kicks on this side, 10 band kicks on this side, go over to tumble track, 10 jumps. I would do that three times in a row because I have 15 people in front of me I need to help, right? And I can set two to three sets of each station up. So there's two to three spots to do the um, stretching. There's two to three spots, but like trapezoid, 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 trapezoid with a slider in between each one. That's three sets of spots where people can do the leg lowers. And then, you know, three different sets of bands that people can go do kicks. And then obviously there's plenty of room on the tumble track for three people to go at the same time or a springboard or a trampoline or something like that. I would have people rotate through those four or five stations to be a flexibility circuit. That's probably the most effective way to do it. In a warm up. obviously you're doing, you know, everyone's warming up together or before practice or everything that kind of stuff. But yeah, I would, I would do five, five reps of a five second lower, the five second hold. The only reason I say that is because in one of the studies that came out on heavy eccentrics for hamstring uh, stretching, that's what they use as a protocol that was pretty effective. So I kind of just take that and try to apply it to other areas. Um, Cause we don't really know if a gymnast does five sets of five reps, is that going to make the hamstrings longer? We're just kind of taking theoretical data from other studies that have shown that and trying to use the best thing that we have right now. All right. Um, Christy's going to ask her question on video. Let's go. Hi. Hello. Um, so I have a couple of girls who either they're just naturally anxious or they came to me from a gym that did a lot of pushing down in splits and they're just like super nervous so i have a girl who's um level seven and she's got a switch leap to 180 but if she sits on the floor in her split i mean we're lucky to get 120 on any given day mm -hmm. um so i for the most part my approach has just been like okay well you're making your angles and your skills so yeah. we'll just leave it the way it is. But I know it frustrates her and she feels self-conscious about it. So yeah. I'm wondering like kind of what the approach is there. I know, yeah, I've had a couple of these too. It's like stretching PTSD, right? Because they've like gotten so aggressive with some of my stuff. So yeah, for these kids, I think there's two things. One is just like, obviously being very clear. I'm sure you are like, we don't do that here. Like that's not gonna happen. So you're not gonna worry about it. But two is that, I think a lot of this is it's actually about control. If you think about it, it's about, they're they're them being in control versus somebody else is in control of what they're doing so obviously when you're getting pushed down you are you're not in control and it's terrifying right if you can find ways to have them be more like driving the driving the bus in terms of their flexibility work it's gonna be a little bit better which is why actually i'm a huge fan of doing active flexibility and the slider eccentrics for these type of kids because you can get down into a split almost the exact same way of a static stretch versus eccentric but if your hands are on panel mats and you're the one slowly lowering you you feel much more in control, and your body's like, all right, I can deal with this a little bit. You could have someone flip over into a leg driver where both heels are up on a panel mat, and they're kicking back behind them, like they lift their hips up and kick back. That angle is probably going to be 170, 180 if they have that available motion. So just finding ways to do the exact same thing, but in you know trick trick away so that they feel like they're in control and they feel like they're safe. Um, I've had a couple kids who really struggled with that too, and eccentrics are a great way to do it on the sliders kicks backwards, tumble track kicks, and then doing band assisted kicks are really good too. So having them do like a light TheraBand that's gonna give them a lot of range. Like obviously if you wanted to have something get stronger, you'd make the TheraBand tighter or harder. But for a kid that's really nervous, give them a lighter TheraBand that's intentionally a little longer than normal and they'll have their full range kick and they won't be so worried mm -hmm. about it. They're the one doing the, the thing. No one's like stretching them passively. Yeah, now this same kid is also, so we just, um... I just had a little consultation with her PT um, and he's saying that her joints are all too loose. So I didn't know if that's playing in, like if her muscles are compensating. So Could she be. had she had like twisted her ankle. And of course, because she's worried about everything, she was like, well, I don't know what to do. I'm like, okay, we're gonna go see Glenn. It's gonna be fine. He's gonna tell us what's happening. And he did that. Um, that little test where you kind of like pulled down on the ankle, you know, and yeah. he was like, this is moving too much. Yeah. And you know, she'd already had like her kneecap kind of slipped to the side a couple sure. years ago. So I don't, that's the other kind of thing with this one. This yeah. is one gymnast is like, I just, I'm so scared to stretch anything to put stress on oh, the joint. Yeah. 
Totally. And that's, it's, a, it's like a blessing and a curse, right? Because the people who are naturally hypermobile do well in gymnastics at a young age and they kind of continue through the levels, right? They can get into positions, but they're also more at risk for some of these like instability type things. So it could be that she's got slightly more laxity and she's like nervous. So she's like kind of guarded about that. These people, again, this is why eccentrics are so good and acupuncture is so good. They need to get strong. They really need a great strength program, whether it's like strength conditioning, but also active flexibility because they need stability. They need strength. They need like, you know, to tighten their joints up a little bit because their laxity is so high. That's why, again, like eccentric stuff are so awesome because you get that control factor, but you also get strengthening. Eccentric helps strengthen that deepest part of the range of motion. That's the most, that's the most problematic for a lot of kids. So you want to specifically work on that all the way through. So I, I'd be, I'd be going nuts with that kind of stuff. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Next up, um, my apologies if I pronounced your name wrong. Lei Wei is going to ask their question on video. Hello. Hi. Dave. Hello. How are you? Hi. I'm great. Thank you. Oh, I just want to ask. I've been working on my splits uh, for years now, uh, yep. two three times a week. So I I work with two contortion coaches. So they made me do like lunges around the stretch and side split frog and all three splits but they seem to be seem to be stuck at a few inches above ground and i also do ballet two, two times a week so we do all this kicking cool. and leg racing and i'm not sure if it has something to do with my hamstring injuries that i've had years ago mm -hmm. and i've had it three times in my life i, I didn't consult any physicians at mm -hmm. the time do you think it's the scar tissue from the healing that i should mm -hmm. It should be addressed or yeah so it could be it could be some of that right if you have an old hamstring injury um you could have some scarring inside of there that's making it challenging but also there could be some guarding there from like a long-term injury um i think that the the important thing to think about here is, is to make really good progress and flexibility we have to understand that the frequency is really important here so six days a week is probably going to be what you need you need you know some sort of very specific stretching static stretching pnf active flexibility has to happen at least for you know five or so minutes per muscle group per week. So six days a week is probably what you need. That's kind of what the research says is how you get really good progress and range of motion. But all stretching work that you do, right, whether it's stretching, active flexibility and stuff, the reason it works is it helps to desensitize the nervous system and the brain, right? There's these uh, nerve endings in your muscles called nociceptors that kind of detect pain and the danger, and they kind of send a signal like, whoa, pause, pause right now, right? So you have to consistently stretch at a high volume five to six days per week to desensitize the muscle and to calm down that and you build a tolerance to stretch. So my guess, my first guess would that mean that maybe the, the frequency or the, the duration needs to go up a little bit. So five to six days per week for maybe a little bit more uh, static stretching or, or active stretching. And then also, I think this is a time when doing some loaded eccentric work is really good, right? So particularly for people with hamstring issues, this happens in younger people that I work with that have growth plate issues, but it happens in older people as well who are kind of getting into stretching work or gymnastic stuff or ballet later in life. They don't really have the same natural mobility that they used to have when they were younger. So single leg kickstand RDLs are a great way to get this hamstring because you could argue it's going to kind of maybe help put pressure on the muscle and make it longer, kind of get that scar tissue to kind of work its way through. That's like what we do for tendons. But also you can make the argument that's going to help kind of slowly load the hamstring and build up some of that comfort level that maybe there's some guarding there from your old hamstring injuries. So yeah, if you were in front of me, I would say let's bump the stretching up to five to six days per week of doing a really good static or active stretching protocol. Let's try to add in two to three sets of eccentrics, you know, maybe every day to try to increase some of that mobility. And let's also make sure that we're doing stuff that's specific to the motion you want to get, right? So those sliders might be really, really good as well for eccentrics. I'd probably go a combination of those two. If you're really not making any progress, um, sometimes it might be worth it to get screened by a physio to see if your hips are maybe uniquely shaped. Sometimes you can have some some issues. There's this thing called a Craig's test that somebody can do very quickly to see that. And an x-ray, you know, would, would also show you if you have some unique hips, because maybe that last one inch is just really a bony thing. And okay. you're not going to do that last little bit, but I'd, I'd probably try four weeks of the five or six days per week, the eccentrics, all that kind of stuff first, before I went the x-ray route. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Alrighty. Next we have CJ. CJ, what's going on? Hey, yeah. you hear me? Good? Yeah, what's going on? All right, how you doing? Uh, thanks for having me, first of all. This is awesome. Uh, right. So this is kind of like a two-parter, I guess. I don't know, we'll find out. 
Uh, so you kind of talked about like frequency, um, but I was wondering about well, that light's bright in the background. Sorry about that. I didn't realize that. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> we don't judge. Don't worry. We don't judge. Uh, uh, so uh, is there any like flexibility, how do I say this, uh, guidelines for age in terms of like flexibility frequency? Because I have, I, I coach group girls that are like all over the place as far as age. Like my youngest is like six or seven, and then my oldest is like 16, right? Yeah. Um, so what I, my brain kind of thought based on what you've been saying and what other people have been saying, you know, I don't do uh, stretching every single day with them because I, I feel like that's too much to some degree with the younger ones, especially. Yeah. Um, same thing with the older ones because some of my older ones are like already like really, really flexible and hypermobile. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm like, I don't want to over push that. So sure. in terms of age, mm-hmm. right, are there any like frequency guidelines that need to be expanded yeah. on or anything? Unfortunately, I can't give you a great answer because there's not, there's not nothing in the peer reviewed literature that I know that says a 10 year old to stretch this much versus a 15 year old versus a 20 year old, right? So unfortunately, no. But what I will say is that you can, and this is kind of what I do as a coach too, right? So I, you can work flexibility every day, but have different buckets for different kids, right? So in the team that I work in front of me that I had, right, I, I actually took a break from coaching this last summer for shift stuff. But when I was working with a team, I have 20 kids in front of me, there's probably seven of those kids that are like just naturally more stiff. They're the powerful gymnast, they got crazy tumbling, right? But they're just like really, really tight. You have probably seven kids that are like, wet noodles right or super floppy or super loose goosey and you got some kids in the middle they're just like eh, they're kind of on both sides of the spectrum so when we do flexibility circuits I, I try to intentionally separate them I write two circuits right I write two circuits my, my approach to circuits is soft tissue stuff stretching right eccentrics active flexibility go do some drills that reinforce whatever you're doing we work that way in a circuit if the kids that are really really tight I say okay maybe we do three things that are more about muscle stretching soft tissue one thing at the end or two things at the end that are more active flexibility. The kids that are really, really loosey goosey, I say, barely do the stretching stuff. Just make sure it's properly done comfortable, but go active flexibility, eccentrics, strength, drill. Like I want them to do all strengthening and all active flexibility. So that's, that's how you can go about working some sort of flexibility with the whole group and dividing them into who maybe needs more what. And then what you do is you follow that up with different days where you focus on different things, right? So say you do have, you know, kids that come twice a week, they, they barely are there for any time at all, they're younger, you just do the basic active flexibility stuff and stretching and technique work, really solid two days per week, you do a good warm of those two days, and you just leave it at that with some side stations versus the other kids that come five days per week, maybe two or three days, you're really working on those specific circuits, where a couple other days, it's just the warm up and some active flexibility stuff as an event warm up, right? So we hop on beam, we do a kick complex, a, a leap complex, we hop on bars and do a nice, you know, low bar circuit, high bar circuit, that is their flexibility work for the day. So you can still get it every single day, but that doesn't mean let's just sit there and stretch or do all this for every single day, five days in a row. The warm up should get that for most people and you add in what you need more based on that. So I think that answers your question. If not, let me know. I'm new. There you go. Okay. Uh, yeah, pretty much. So basically, um, make sure I'm understanding, right? So if I have athletes, uh, a, and then athlete B, athlete A is super flexible, right? She's got her splits like all the way down, whatever. Yep. Um, and then athlete B, who was tight as a rock, athlete A kind of stretch a little bit, but only were about too much. And then athlete B um, stretch more. And then athlete A work on the strength stuff. Athlete B, this is okay. All right, cool. And I usually I usually make a whiteboard and I write, if we're the younger groups, the coaches lead the flexibility stuff. We say, okay, everyone do this. Now everyone do this. If we're the older athletes, we separate them into two groups and they kind of have partners they work with because there's kids that are kind of the similar situation as them. And then I give them stations to work through or things to work through. And they would go, okay, and you have 15 minutes to get through this complex three times. If, you know, here's the left side for those people who are a little bit more uh, mobile and those kids that are maybe not as much, they're stronger. And they work through that three rounds of that circuit. And then we might do something all together with like a kit complex or something like that. All right. Yeah, that works. Cool. Thanks. No if you look at the research, though, just so I'm really clear on people, because I want to summarize this because they don't want to read it. The research says that if you want to increase flexibility, it has to be five to six days per week. It has to be about 60 seconds per muscle group when you're doing a stretch or you're doing something. And it has to be a total of five minutes per week of muscle group stretching or flexibility work. So that means two sets of 30 seconds per day. It also says that stretching, holding and duration 60 seconds is just as effective as one to two minutes. And it's just as effective, if not a little bit more effective than a two plus minute hold, right? So five to six days per week, 
about 60 seconds per muscle group per stretch. So if you have a couple of things you want to work on, and then you want to use a variety of different things to work that stretching, flexibility, soft tissue work, right? Like hands-on work. It's, it's relaxing stuff. It's not making muscles longer. Eccentrics, we think does increase length of what's called a fascicle or a sarcomere over time. So you want to do both of those kind of things. And then you have to make sure you're looking at a strength conditioning program and not overloading someone with just too much of the same muscle group. So yeah, that's like the evidence-based guideline for great, most effective, minimal effective dose for stretching. Okay. Um, and if I made the second part, I guess, sure. um, this deals with the hypermobility issue, right? right? Um, so I've only worked at this gym that I've been at for about three years or so. And, uh, there's been quite a few athletes that I've, you know, just picked up from coaching, right? Just, you know, hey, you're doing this group now that have, are very prone to injury because they are extremely flexible, right? I felt like that was because when they were younger, they were doing too much stretching, right? So I guess that still lies in the same bucket of more strength stuff versus stretching for them. Because like I have one girl, let's call her athlete A again, right? Who has like, who has had several, several injuries, right? And I'm like, this is, you don't need to stretch anymore. Like you're basically done, like pretty much. That's what it seems like with her. Um, so I guess that still goes back in that bucket of if she's hypermobile, go back to the strength stuff for the most part then. Yeah, so in, in the situation that you have, right? So if I had an athlete who was on the other end of the spectrum, which is just like the struggle bus is so real with flexibility. And they, again, they just picked the wrong parents, unfortunately. I would give them two extra days of a specific flexibility circuit to improve their flexibility. But the other end of the athlete who's super loosey goosey, I'm giving them two days per week of, of grunt work, boring prehab that's trying to get their stabilizer stronger. So, I'll, and I'll just tell you exactly what it is. For the upper body, I would give them uh, dumbbell exercises, case okay, so of side lying dumbbell external rotation, prone T's, prone Y's, prone U's, standing full cans, banded ER and IR and face pulls or some sort of upper back rowing, right? That's all the things they need. If you look at research on shoulder instability to stabilize the shoulder and keep it from feeling loose, right? And that's work that my boss has done with like pro pitchers and the Red Sox and stuff. So we give those stuff out all the time. I'm saying, if you wanna keep your shoulders, you know, not from having problems or your hips from not having problems, you have to do this two times per week in order to stay nice and nice and strong. For the hips, for people that have like, like, like again, SI joint issues, low back issues, hip issues, because they're so hypermobile. The things that typically seem to work for them are weighted single leg hip lifts to make the, like we are notoriously awful at training the glutes in, in gymnastics, but like strength, like real hard strength. We do billions of squat jumps, but like no hamstring glute at all. And if you look at the research on what's the most effective, weighted single leg hip lifts, uh, loaded single leg Romanian deadlifts, okay, side plank clamshells, side plank leg lifts or, or side plank with a leg lift that can abduction lateral band walks right those are probably going to be really effective to get the hip rotators and the hamstrings to be really strong and those very much protect the hip joint right again think about what gymnasts do they do billions of squat jumps and they run then they squeeze their legs straight and they squeeze their legs together so their groin and their quads are like and their hip flexors are super jacked up right so let alone just the natural adaptation of gymnastics is the more you do gymnastics your quads hip flexors and groin and calves will get stiff so will your lats like we were talking about with the girl who was on earlier right just doing high level gymnastics is going to make those areas super super stiff so you have to combat that with soft tissue work but if you're really hypermobile and loosey-goosey the thing that keeps your hips nice and snug is all your glute muscles all your hip rotator muscles so i would give those athletes twice per week of core and hip kind of work where I did the shoulder stuff, I'd say, okay, one day you're doing your shoulder circuit, one day you're doing your hip circuit. We give a lot of that out. And for the athletes that come to us at our facility and do that, that's like a mandatory, like you have to stay here for 10 minutes after you do your lift or you're at the gym and do this boring grunt work because you're going to have shoulders that are kind of starting to slide a little bit or your hip flexors are going to be killing you or your joints will hurt quite a bit because they're just so lax, right? The ligaments are screaming for dear life sometimes. So yeah, I'd give the really, really tight athletes who are stiff Two, two times per week of extra flexibility work and eccentric work, whereas I'd give the other athletes two times per week of you know the more hypermobile strength work. And for younger athletes or those that don't come often, I'm trying to either lead them through the stuff myself and through a circuit as a side station, or if it's really something they have to work on, it's like, all right, man, we got to get a home program going here. Like, I know it sucks, but you can definitely find 15 minutes when you're watching Netflix to do you know some extra stuff here and there. Like, I, I guarantee... If, if it matters that much to them, they'll find time to do it. All right, uh, cool. Um, 
I guess third part. I don't know where this is coming from, but oh, basically oh. going. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I've always struggled with um, elbows, right? Yeah. So based on following you for the past multiple years, right? I've gotten a lot of my girls. Their life flexibility's gotten really, really good. Their hip power's gotten really good. My tumbling skyrocketed over the summer. Nice. Um, but the other athletes that I don't coach, right? I'm not saying I know more than them, but uh, the coaches don't always, they're more intent about, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, overextending elbows, like um, hyper, uh, hyper extension. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I've got a couple of girls that are prone to elbow issues. Yeah. Right. And I worked with one for a bit. Um, actually, I went through her with her, um, like step by step on with her PT stuff. Right. Cause she was in my group. Right. She brought her physio stuff to the gym. And I was like, let me help you out as best I can. Gosh, right. We need more of you. Uh, yeah, I just, I'm doing that now with another girl. Jesus. Um, that's a whole different thing. Um, <laughs> might ask you about that later. Um, but uh, the other girl, it's, again, say Athlete A. Um, she's in the other group, and she's got she's prone to a lot of elbow issues, especially on bars, right? It's constantly complaining. Um, so how I, – I know there's no easy way of preventing this, but how is – what's the best way of monitoring – the hyperextension of the elbow and or her knees too. her knees she can yeah. sit flat and pike and then her knee her feet go curl up yeah. right in that pike shape and her knee i'm like no yeah. <laughs> so yeah again part of this is like natural selection by the sport right, right. And more hypermobile people typically are more hyperextended in their joints so there's three things to it one is you have to teach them the idea of like soft like soft elbows, soft knees, right? They shouldn't be doing pushups and bouncing to end range. They shouldn't be like locking their elbows up to end range, just teaching soft. Easier said than done. Two is you have to maximize the mobility above and below that joint, right? The joint will hyperextend more if the wrist or the shoulder joint is not, you know, moving enough. So as they get more, you know, strength work done, if they do get stiff in their lats or in their upper back or their wrists get tight from lots of gripping work on bars, if they lose their wrist extension, it puts more hyperextension on their, on their um, elbow. Right. If they lose their overhead shoulder flexibility, they're probably going to lock their elbow out more aggressively when they hit the table for your chanko, do a front handspring or a beam walk over, whatever else it is. So you have to really maximize above and below for flexibility so that that middle joint isn't making up the motion. And then this kid's going to get like stupidly strong, like isolated grunt work of bicep curls, tricep extensions, forearm strength. But then also, again, up, upper back, the stronger your upper back is and your shoulder is, the more force is off your elbow. And the more goes into muscles, not in the elbow joint itself, which is like an issue with OCD and stuff like that. So you have to have someone who's doing that same kind of grunt work mentality of, you know, chin ups, push ups, bicep curls, all that kind of stuff, upper back. But if you can teach soft elbows and monitor their workloads of high impact stuff, make sure the wrist and shoulders really flexible and get them on that kind of strength program that's kind of grunt work, the combination of those three things usually makes them be pr pretty good. Okay, I think I think I'm good for now. I'll probably have more later, but I think I'm good for now. That answers like the bulk of my stuff. So I appreciate it. Yeah, oh, thanks. Yeah, Red, no problem. Alrighty. Um just wanted to ask, Patrick, since you have your hand raised, if you could just put in the group chat if you're willing to ask your question on video. Um but in the meantime, Petra is gonna ask their question. Hello, Petra. Hi. Um, how are you? How are you? Uh, I have a question in terms of the eccentric um, flexibility. So you said five seconds hold at the end, but let's say a kid, an athlete missing this much range at the end. So do you go to the end range of her split or yeah. you hold it a little bit above? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we would want to go, if we're talking about like the splits on sliders, we'd want to go hips very square straight ahead as best as they can and only go as low as we possibly can until they hit a sticking point where it feels pretty uncomfortable. We would hold that lowest possible comfortable motion for about five seconds. So it, sh it should be a little uncomfortable, right? It's going to be stretching, but we don't want to go so low that the hips square out or we don't want to go so low that we're like not really hitting their end range. It's like kind of like not close enough because the thought process, Petra, with this is that when we do eccentric work, we're stressing the muscle tissue itself and either the muscle itself is getting longer over time or the, the ligaments and stuff like that are starting to adapt to that stretch, right? So we, we're stretching out what are called fascicles and, and other areas of the muscle. So we want to make sure the muscle is the thing taking the most stretch. So I've had some athletes who it looks 
not impressive at all. It's very square. It's like barely down, but they're actually getting a hamstring stretch versus when we just let them do splits, they turn their hips out, they arch their back and it looks like it goes five inches lower, but it's not coming from their muscles. It's coming from their lower back and from their hips. So we'd rather go a little bit more strict with how, how the position is and go to the point of discomfort and do that every single day. That's probably going to be the most effective way to do it. Okay. Thank you. And I have uh, a few more questions quickly. Sure. Sorry. Uh, one um, uh, caught my attention about the frog stretch. You said don't relax into it. So, but then what do you like? So, what do you engage? Uh, you engage your inner thighs, or you are like going against the the ground. So, you know, there's that type of uh, like stre not stretching, but when you hold, like you want to close your knees, but you hold your arms yeah. against it. Yeah. And and then hold it for a few seconds and then let it just relax. So is this yep. the same thing uh, like with the frog thing? And is it, can you use the same thing in like uh, with the slider eccentric that you like kind of like dig into the ground, pull it towards your knee a little bit, yep. your heel, and then relax down or yep. how's that? Yeah, no, great question. And so I think it's, I'm really happy you asked that because this can clarify is it's not like I'm against doing a relaxing frog stretch. I think it's fine to do a passive frog stretch. The problem is when we, we only use the frog stretch passively for like one to two minutes and that, that's all we do. So I think it's okay to do a static stretching, but I think there's a very big difference between pushing down into a frog stretch and just being, you know, push, 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 push. But you can think about squeezing your butt muscles and trying to think about lifting your knees up off the ground like you're contracting your glute muscles to kind of lift your knees up and that by by virtue pulls you down lower if that makes sense i think that's much more of an active type position i think core position is really important too so somebody should be bracing their core and doing a nice core contraction to help them kind of stay in a nice good position if you're just arching your back and pushing really really hard you're probably putting a lot of extra pressure on the ligaments themselves so i think that's the first part of your question the second part of your question i think you're describing pnf stretching which is a really awesome way to do this as well so when you're doing a con it's called contract relax so say i'm in a frog stretch if i push my knees down to the ground and i'm activating my groin muscles i'm turning on my groin muscles when you relax and you kind of lift your hips up you kind of get a temporary extra relaxation of your groin muscles so that's a a really great way to do that too is on the eccentrics you can kind of go out as low as you can push your foot down into the ground hold for five then relax try to go a little bit lower push down hold go a little bit lower yeah pnf stretching is a really good way to kind of trick your muscle to relax a little bit and again we're, we're increasing the tolerance to stretch over time or we're building up our discomfort we're desensitizing muscles so it's a good temporary thing that we can do it won't stick around permanently unless we do some eccentrics, we go do some drills, we go do some active flexibility, we use good technique. So it's a great way to get a nice, good, you know, vibration assisted foam rolling and stretching stuff like that. Those help get you gain range of motion fast, but you have to go then do something to make it stick long term. And having good technique is probably the best way to do that. So I think that answers your question. Yes, thank you. And the other one is like, um, well, um, I am a professional ballet dancer, but I work with athletes. Cool. So I, I don't have background in, in uh, physical therapy, okay. but uh, so that's why I'm curious about, they have their splits down, right? On the ground and we are doing uh, leaps and or split jumps. And then, and then they just cannot get that range or, or when they do um, like uh, arabesque, you know, arabesque when they lift the, uh, it's like, I just, it feels like, like it's just, I don't know if it's their, their back or just their hip flexor is very, very tight that it doesn't go in. It's just, they are just lean forward. Yeah. Yeah. They can get, so. yeah. It's a good question. So I think that the, um, what we were talking about before is a lot of times, I think we're really good at strengthening like the quad muscles and the hip flexor muscles and the hamstrings. Yes. But oftentimes we're not really good at strengthening the, the butt muscles themselves that are responsible for that last little bit of range. So for these athletes, they need two things. One is they need strength work specifically to that, right? So weighted hip lifts are really, really important. That's like, I can't tell you how many programs I've looked at that do like 500 squat jumps and 500 sprint work. And they literally don't do anything for their glutes that is strong enough or more challenging. So deadlifting and hip lifting, that's like 
the raw strength you need to pull against gravity, the more your leg goes up, the harder it gets to pull, 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 pull. So you need a really nice, strong hip muscle and glute muscle. So all those exercises, the hip lifts, the, the side plank clamshells, the side plank leg lifts, those are the muscles that, that pull your legs up into those positions for splits. So you need to work the specific strength work, right? I'd probably go like three to four sets of eight to 12 reps. And like, by the point when you're done, you're like, man, my butt is like sore, like in a good way, right? Lunges and stuff that develops those muscles. And then two is we want to make sure that when we do active flexibility drills, we're not setting the athlete up to cheat in any other way. So a lot of times we see athletes who are trying to work the back leg of a kick, they'll go on hands and knees and they'll swing their leg really hard and they just arch their back a ton. It's not really coming from their hip. So what you can do is you can have someone do a curl up hip lift, right? They can curl up their uh, into a ball on a, on a box, let their leg tuck down and just lift that back leg up and it makes it so only their butt muscle can lift to that last little range of motion or have someone kneel down next to a beam or next to a wall and lift their front leg up and hold that last degree of motion to do end range strengthening and active flexibility don't just do switch leaps and switch jumps try to get stronger and then do back leg kicks and front leg kicks that are really focusing on kicking and holding those last 10 degrees of motion and sometimes for athletes it's just about strength other times athletes just have never felt that that level of activation before and they go oh that's what it feels like and then when they go jump they go oh yeah that's what it actually feels like and it kind of connects the dots a little bit for them okay thank you so much no problem let's do uh i didn't realize it's 9 30 so <laughs> we've been here for an hour and a half but let's do a couple more and then uh we should probably go <laughs> okay patrick patrick There we go. Can you hear me now? What's going on? Yo, sorry. It's uh, very late in the UK, so I'm uh, in my pajamas. I'm so of all UK accents, man. Nick, Nick's accent is so cool, and I, I really want one. Oh, fine. No, just, just come and live here for a bit. It's so good. <laughs> I know. <laughs> What's up, man? Um, yeah, so my question is, I've got... Um, I've got a few gymnasts that have got a, really, a bit of an issue with opening the shoulders, but I've got one in particular who worries me a little bit. Um, we did things like wall angels and YTWs in that the other day in one of our training sessions. And it just it just looks like his shoulder blades just do not move anywhere. It's mm -hmm. almost like his his lower body is flexibility is fine, like legs, hip flex, all fine. But the upper body, it's it's almost like it's just one giant muscle. It just doesn't <laughs> seem to move at all. I'm just really worried that I like I've tried a few different things now and I'm, I'm just getting a bit worried that it's more of a maybe a genetics thing than it than anything else so I just wondered whether or not you had any advice um to give if not I'm probably going to suggest maybe go to a physio and get some stuff screened yeah so so genetic stuff it would be body wide right so if someone is genetically mm -hmm. stiff everywhere they're going to be tight everywhere so you ever heard of a bitens test you know what that is no so a bite and screen is a way to look for hypermobility, right? It's a nine point scale. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you, you get a point for each thing that you can do. So you have the athlete see if they can touch their thumb to their forearm. And I can obviously do it. So that's one point, right? And it would be on both sides. So one, two, if they can hyperextend their pinky 90 degrees, that's another point. So three, four, if their elbows hyperextend, that's five mm -hmm. and six. If their knees hyperextend seven, eight, if they can do a full pike stretch and palms to the floor, that's a nine. Someone more than five out of nine is considered hypermobile from like a laxity or, or a ligament point of view. So I would first, I, I would run through that real quick and you can totally do that. You know, it's safe for you to do yeah. that, but just see if he's got laxity. If he's like a two out of 10, that kid's stiff, that kid's joint stiffness, right? And you're like, all right, we'll be a little bit less aggressive. He's gonna be super powerful, but he's just gonna be real tight. So that'd be the first thing I do. The second thing is whenever somebody has ongoing struggles with shoulder flexibility, you always have to look at the upper back of the thoracic spine, right? Like you need a lot of thoracic spine flexibility. If your thoracic spine is stuck like this, and if this kid is one big ball of muscle, he might be like this. If your shoulders are rounded like this and your chest is forward, your shoulder blades can't move anywhere, right? In order for you to like, if I sat like this and I put myself rounded, I can only get my arms up to here. It's not until I round my back this way do I get my last little bit of flexibility, right? So if that kid's thoracic spine is stiff and a lot of male gymnasts get this in particular because of how much plange work and ring work they do in P-bar work, they're like a living turtle shell, right? And it's awesome for technique, but they then lose their ability to go the other way. So the way you screen that is you have them sit 45 degrees on a box, hands across with a dowel, they should be able to turn 50 degrees each way with their knee, like with their sitting on a box, they can't use their hips. 
they have to turn 50 degrees on both sides and then have him do a seal stretch and look up to the ceiling, you should see a really good arch in his upper back. So not a kink in his lower back. It shouldn't be like zip, like from a, a hinge point. It should be a nice fluid, really, really good smooth arch. And he should have a really good arch from his neck all the way down to his lower back. If those joints aren't bending enough, it's impossible for his shoulders to go anywhere. You could be the, you could be a wizard with all your shoulder flexibility stuff, but he's not going to go anywhere. So someone doing wall angels, they won't, if they don't have upper back flexibility, they can't get to the wall and it just looks really yeah. awkward. They can't move themselves at all. Their elbows come off the wall when they get a little higher. So I would be like trying to hammer and see if that, if the thoracic spine is, is part of the issue. So I would go, you know, bite and scale first. Yeah, really good thoracic spine screen. And the way you would fix those thoracic spine issues, if he has that is uh, put a dumbbell behind your head, put your upper back on a foam roller and brace your core and drive your elbows back and extend over a foam roller to um, windmills, which are laying on your side and rotating your body, uh, thoracic spine windmills, hands and knees rotations, which we have videos we can send you. I would hammer those mm -hmm. for quite a long time. If he gets through all that stuff for two weeks and like literally nothing's changing at all, then you have someone go to a physio because they, they might be able to look at his like uh, shoulder joints and you can do laxity yep. testing to see if he's really tight. They can look at his lat versus his teres major versus his pec minor. Like there's a lot of different soft tissue things that could be probably uh, the issue. And I'd, I'd just go through a checklist and I go all the way through. And if you talk to a physio and the, the person just means well, but has no idea about gymnastics, just email me and I'll send you exactly what I would do and we can hook it up. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I did. I did have a look at his lats, and his his lats are very overdeveloped. So I mm -hmm. initially thought, okay, maybe we just need to work on that a bit more. Yep. But um, we've worked on it a bit, and it has helped. But it's just it's really, really noticeable when it comes to like his bridge and his handstand. He just cannot open yeah. the armpits anymore. I, I would I would bet good money on like. Pec minor T spine is probably the next yeah. thing to really tackle. So pec minor, you look when you have them lay on their back, their shoulder mm -hmm. blades should be able to get completely flat to the ground. If you look from the top down and their shoulders elevate up a couple inches off the ground, the pec minor is really stiff and they're not going to be able to open their chest back for a bridge. Mm -hmm. But a bridge requires like a stupid amount of upper back flexibility to get backwards yeah. properly. So if you don't have that at all, and guys are notoriously uh, not great at that because mm -hmm. of like a, the skill work and pommel work, um, it's going to show up in a bridge. So I, I would screen those things out first. Okay, no problem. I'm going to quickly make some notes and try and note down all that before I forget it. Yeah, and just shoot me an email if you're if you're confused. I can help you out, man. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Cheers. Is, it, is You ever heard the term Muppet? Nick calls me a Muppet sometimes. It's my favorite British yeah. insult of all time. Yeah, that, it's, <laughs> it stems from a, um, there's a show called The Muppets that's over here in the UK. So uh, yeah, if you're interested to know more, look that up. <laughs> he called me a muppet on a podcast and i almost beat my pants i was laughing so hard i couldn't do it. <laughs> thanks brother thanks see you later all right is that it sir we we get through it got more we yeah. have two more questions do it two more. Questions. two more and then we'll be good okay uh summer summer okay so yes um <laughs> So personally for me, you know, my legs are strong, I guess, but I wish they were stronger. And our floor at um, my gym is just sucks. Yeah. Like there's just dead spots everywhere. Like, you know, like we fixed it. It didn't really get fixed. We tried. Anyway, so I go and I lift sometimes, but I always overlift and I always get super sore, but I can never like figure out a balance. And then I also know like sometimes lifting isn't the best for gymnastics. Nah, I disagree. Yes. Really? I disagree. Really? I know, because like, I think I've used too much weight though. That's okay. Yeah, this is this if is I, the application, not the tool. But um, what's your? Do you want to go to college? Is that the goal here? Yeah, that would be that. You know, that's the goal, I guess. Yeah. So every single college program, and I'm really lucky. I work yeah, with. Them, that's why I started. Every single lifting. one lifts exactly. Yeah. So everyone lifts, right? Every gymnast should lift. The key here is when you lift, right? Right? Are you in season right now? Yeah. Right. Like this yeah. is not a this is not a good time to lift, right? Like you're not going to yeah. get a lot stronger in the middle of season, right? The best time to lift is in the summer, right? The off season. So mm -hmm. the best way to do it is 
two days per week, you should be lifting in a full body kind of split. And then three days or four days, you do your gymnastic strength. Then in preseason, you lift a couple of days, but it's all like power generation. It's not like crazy high volume and stuff like that. Then you slowly kind of go into more maintenance for uh, gymnastic care type stuff. So at our facility here in Boston, we have probably like 30 college people gymnasts come to our facility in the summer. And you'd be surprised at like how not, it's hard but it's not like we're doing like 10 sets or like 45 exercises of the same muscle group. It's really balanced, right? So what are you doing for, for like exercise wise? I just, I squat, I deadlift, I do like extensions, um, yep. Bulgarian squats, uh, yep. Yep. hamstring curls, yep. hack squat, kind of just like, you know, just normal like weightlifting. Like I'll like go and search like, like on TikTok, like, lifter people and like i'll just follow into their workouts girl i i'm all about your work ethic and like trying to get after it like it's great but tiktoker is not the place to find a good fitness workout uh, <laughs> <not>. thank you <laughs> <laughs> it's all good but um so think about it right so you said hack squat you said knee extensions you said split squats and you said regular squat and then how many times do you do squatting type movements at the gym like gymnastics gym a lot Squat jumps, sprinting, right? Girl, your quads are probably lit right now, like way too much, right? So you've got to adjust the volume a little bit. So if we do it, we'd have one day, you'd probably do a, a, a weighted hip lift, like a, like a TRX or a barbell weighted hip lift, right? One day you would do a squat. And then you have another day where you do split squats and step ups, right? That's probably all you need for your main movements, right? The rest of your stuff would be filled in with accessory work. So probably you'd be looking at like four sets of eight of a rear foot elevated split squat. There's a lot of ways to make exercises harder weight sets reps pauses tempos so the best thing that we give all of our girls particularly college girls who are bound is is bilateral elevated like split squats right so front foot up and back foot a spot with a five second lower and a pause at the bottom they are mm -hmm. awful right but you don't need a lot of weight to make them really really hard and it works on a deep flexibility you would need like for a split or for a switch leap so like that's very different than five sets of five with the heaviest dumbbells you can possibly lift. And that's going to trash your legs, right? So we're not talking about super heavy, super hardcore all the time. There's probably a period during the summer where we're like maybe like four to six weeks, we'll have people get after it and lift pretty heavy, but it's, it's few and far between. We're not having people lift super heavy most of the time, because like you said, your legs just get super, super sore. So part of this yeah. is about exercise selection. Part of this is about the sets and reps that you're doing. And part of this is about making sure you're having a good spread of exercises that we do. So you're, I mean, right now you're, you're going to probably start, you know, meet season and go through it, but what year of school are you in? I'm a junior. Yeah. So next, Texas. next spring, right. When you mm -hmm. finish season, email me and I'll write you a full program and I'll give you exactly what you need, like real life stuff. And we'll just okay. we'll scratch you up there because you probably have all the drive in the world, but you're just, you're getting TikTok. Advice. I just don't know where to do it. And where to put <laughs> it's it. totally yeah. okay. It's all good. Yeah. But we've, we've written programs for like tons of college girls that are around here. So we can get you a good two day program. That's like pretty effective. It's easy to do. You won't be super, super sore. And then myself and Duesh can help you out. But yeah, I would say right now I wouldn't lift a ton. I wouldn't go crazy. Okay. I would do, if anything, I would do the extra work, right? I would do the shoulder flexibility stuff. We talked about the extra stuff. Yeah. Just, just get as good as you can, because what happens is, summer into preseason you get strong as soon as you hit season the season is so brutal like your strength automatically goes down and automatically mm -hmm. you get tighter and more more uh you know strength falls apart and there's nothing you can do to prevent that so like if you're going to lift it's just maintenance care type stuff like that but you're probably just putting so much on your body that it's falling apart a little bit yeah yeah so the best place to the time to do it is after national take three to four weeks of chill get your body recovered feel good and then you do two full six to eight week cycles from you know june to august and then after that you would do a preseason power circuit from like november or up until like november december transition into competition season from now december and through may is just hit it hard with meets okay but yeah thanks let us, let us know and then uh we'll definitely get you hooked up between the shoulder stuff okay. and then next spring okay thank you yeah all right last question is from Quentin. How are your bed sheets so clean? I just noticed that. That is like heaven <laughs> white. That is insane. Your bed is like glowing. Your bed is like glowing right now. Yeah. Can we see your plants? Show off your plants. Oh yeah. They're very Guys, look at how good her plants are. Look at her group plant. Look at her baby group plant. Third one over from the right. That's my favorite thing in the entire world. <laughs> Of course, Sarah has to deal with me every day. <laughs> oh, it's good. It's good. 
right. Who we got last? Quentin. Let's go. Back from round two. I know. Start and end. How about that? It, bro. Uh, it's I like a question. beginning and end I cap. It's great. Your brain. Yeah, I know, right? Got to get it. <laughs> um, so this is a question about beam and yeah. back walkovers. I have an athlete that after she does five or ten of them a day, her back will start to flare up. And, you know, we've been through that. And I tell her to, you know, don't do so many and do other exercises. But my question would be, if floor goes after beam and we, you know, I'm not the coach that's coaching. This is a different coach. And I want to get their input and your input on it. But we advise to not tumble because her back was hurting that day. So my per- question is, you know, they wanted to tumble, but we're like, well, no, your back is hurting. We don't want you to tumble. We don't want you to do this. Would it be better to heat it, to ice it, to not tumble, to let them tumble? Yeah. I, I just wanted to get a PT's side yeah. of it. You know, it's, it's from lower back cranking too hard in the back walkovers, doing them too many times on beam. Yeah. Well, first I of all, I'm sitting here for two hours listening to me rant. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> I don't think I can listen to two hours. So, um, yeah. So I think the first step is to go ahead of the curve and we try very hard. It's sometimes impossible. We try our best to rotate which events maybe are not going to have back bending in them. Right. So if it's with younger athletes, it's not as tricky because vault, they're not doing your chinko stuff like that, but we try mm-hmm. to, all right, if we're working series on beam, we're going to do a lot more like punching and front tumbling stuff like that. We're not going to do a lot of hardcore back tumbling or we'll do basics. Uh, you know, like we'll take a day to do like rebounding drills and trampoline and long tramp and rod strip and like all that kind of stuff, snap down drills and in season, you just got to kind of like do it. But I, I'm a big fan of trying to plan intentionally, which day is going to have more or less of the opposite. And then two is I'm a big fan of trying to make sure we have a very specific cap on how many we're doing, right? Like seven's a pretty exactly. good number. I tell them, I'm like, yo, you got seven to work on. That's with your warm up. That's with your nervous ones. That's with your fall offs. Like we're not going to do 40, 50, because if you, if you just say like, let's just do it by the time they warm up, do an extra side station, do all kinds, it's like into the forties, fifties. And I've measured this before. Like some of our girls were doing like a thousand back bends per month because they would warm up their series. They would do back walkovers. They would do stuff on floor. They would do stuff on vault drills, all that kind of stuff. And it gets very, very out of control, very, very fast. So I would say probably go for a pretty hard cap on how many they're doing. Yeah. But yeah. If they are, do. Yeah. If they're sore, right. If they do like do a lot of back walkovers, they get sore. Then you just got to have them do less tumbling and maybe more trampoline and more side drills. And I'd have those athletes literally do like, if we really have to get tumbling done because we have a meter something out. I'm like, all right, you're going to warm up. You're going to do five of your passes, maybe like two to warm up, one in your routine. Then you're, when everybody else does three of their passes to get more corrections in, you're just going to do side drills or side stations. If, if we can, obviously it'd be, let's not do, you know, any, because you're, you're pretty sore. And I, I, yeah, I mean, icing is, is not going to help with anti-inflammation. It's maybe a pain thing, but I've really reduced the amount of icing by quite some time. I'm not going to realistically as a coach have a kid lay there with a heat pack for 25 minutes unless something's really, really bugging them. They're going to be out for all of practice. So I would just try to modify and give them extra stuff to do. Hip prehab, hip flexibility, core stuff, trampoline, other drills, basics. I'd try to find other ways to fill in their time than just like, you know, sit there twiddling their thumbs because let's be real. That's when we become a chatty fest with some friends and it's going to start to mm-hmm. become tricky. So yeah, I'd, I want to find some other ways to get that. And a lot of athletes who do have back problems if uh, like I, I, if I'm working with them in PT or if my buddies down the road is their PT, I'm like, all right, well, let's put that, bust that prehab list out. Let's go through all your lower body stuff and, you know, use this 20 minutes pretty wisely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks for fielding my questions. No problem, dude. You have the best lighting behind you ever. I'm so jealous. <laughs> I know. It's great. You should get one for your office. <laughs> I know. I have a cool little plaque there. That's what I've been doing. It's like some lettering. That's my coolest edition, but all right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yep. That was a monster. Everyone. That was a good two hour little chunk there. So thank you everyone for being here. We're going to put the recording up. If you missed uh, late, Sarah's going to do her, her wizardry work and put this together and edit it and put it up. Um, so we appreciate everyone here again. If you enjoyed the chat and you want to check out the course, we appreciate it. We understand that people, you know, your, your guys support of our courses and stuff is literally what makes us able to do this stuff. So you want more and you want literally everything of me in the gym, check out the course. Sarah dropped it in the chat below. Um, but if not, uh, we'll just see you guys probably uh, in another future Q and a, or probably like around the bout. We'll start traveling out more. So let us know if you need anything. And, uh, yeah, I think we're good. Later.